Hello, I'm Greg. Welcome to my channel, Midnight Oil Software. In this video, I'm going to teach you how to create the Atari Classic Beam Rider in Unity. So if you've ever wanted to know how to write a classic arcade game from scratch, then grab your favorite beverage, pull up a chair, and follow along as I teach you how to make Beam Rider using Unity. So this video was actually requested by Daniel Breitschaft. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. He was commenting on one of my Defender tutorial videos and saying he'd really love to see a conversion of Atari's classic Beam Rider. Uh, he really wanted to learn how to do the 3D effect of the game, which he felt was an incredible visual innovation. So I was unfamiliar with the game, so I actually had to go look it up on YouTube and he's right, I really do like that visual effect. It's not a 3D game, but you kind of get the illusion of 3D uh, by the way the beams move towards the player. They, they seem to speed up as they get closer to the player, so they're closer together at the top of the screen than they are at the bottom of the screen. And also those hash marks on the screen kind of going up toward an imaginary vanishing point uh, also gives you some perspective that makes it look 3D. So I thought that that would be a fun project to try to reproduce. And so this video is my attempt to do just that. So the very first thing you're gonna to have to do if you're gonna make a game in Unity is you need to download and install Unity. And you can download uh, Windows, Mac, or Linux versions. I'm using a Windows machine, so I'll be using the Windows version. You will need to have a Unity account. Uh, you can get a free account. And that's what I use. I've been doing Unity development for over three years, and I am still using the free account, even though I have some license keys for a pro version. I've never activated it because it's only good for three months, and I don't want to activate it until I really need uh, the features a pro account would provide. So grab your copy of Unity, um, and then you will install Unity Hub, and then I will show you how to create a new Unity project. Once you have downloaded and installed Unity Hub, you should see a screen like this. And this is where you can create a new project and you would choose the template you want to use. Uh, but first you need to have installed a version of Unity. Uh, under my installs, you can see I've got a few different versions of Unity installed here. You can actually install an editor by clicking this button up here and choosing a release you want to install. Uh, it looks like I could update to 2021.3.22F1 which is their recommended long-term support version. I'm still on an older version of the long-term support. I'm just gonna go ahead and use that. If you wanna use a newer one, that should be fine. Um, I don't think I'm doing anything in this project that would matter either way. But once you've selected a version of Unity, you click New Project, and then we're gonna select the 2D URP Core template. And this core will basically um, install the packages that we want for a 2D game. I should point out that Unity doesn't really care if you're making a 2D game or a 3D game. Uh, you can mix and match 2D and 3D components in the same game, but I am using the universal render pipeline, so I wanna make sure I select 2D URP, and this will go ahead and install packages that I know I'll need for a 2D game. So I'm putting it in my tutorials folder on my SSD drive, and I'm gonna give it a name and call it Beam Rider and click create project. And this will take a while, so I will pause the video and then come back after this project has been created. Okay, it has finished creating the project and opened up in the Unity editor and this is what we see. Quick tour here, this is our hierarchy. This is what is in the current scene. So right now we have a scene called sample scene and it's got a main camera and a global light. And if I highlight them here, you can see them displayed in the scene view. So this shows you the objects in the visible part of the scene. And you can scroll around holding down the middle mouse wheel or a scroll wheel. I can grab the screen and move around like that. Uh, you can also select the move tool and move objects around in the scene. You could rotate them, size them and so forth. Um, one thing you can do is switch to the game view, and this will show what the actual game camera is looking at. Right now, there's nothing in our scene to look at, so we just see a blank blue screen, and that is partially controlled by this camera. Uh, if we go down to environment under the camera, it's set to solid color, and it's this blue color. We can go make that black, and now you can see our game view switches to black. 
uh, because we have a black background now that the camera is looking at. Our camera also has an audio listener, so any sounds that we play will be picked up by this listener and sent to the main audio output. We'll be adding some audio sources later in this game to play sound effects. Uh, every object in the Unity game has a transform. So the camera even has a transform. This shows its position, rotation, and scale. So this one is currently at a Y position of 0 0.14 and a Z offset of negative 10. I think I must have fiddled with that and accidentally moved it. We'll put that back to 0. If we were to add an object, like say I want to create a cube, I can go down to 3D object. So I, by the way, I hit right click. And I'm going to say 3D object cube, and you can see that it created a cube. We've got it selected here, and there it is at position 0, 0, 0. Now, my game is set up to automatically create new objects at 0, 0, 0, and that was actually a setting that I set in my preferences, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Uh, if I didn't have that, it would put it basically wherever my mouse was in front of the camera, and that position could be anywhere. And so you'll see a lot of YouTubers when they're doing tutorials, after they create an object, they'll come up here and they'll say reset so that it would reset it back to zero, zero, zero. But I actually have a preference that I set in my user settings to do that for me automatically. So the way you set that is you go up here to edit preferences and we want to go down to scene view and then where it says create object at origin, make sure that that is ticked and it will create your new objects at 0, 0, 0. Uh, another thing I like to do, there's an object called Play Mode Tint, and I set that to some color so that when I go into Play Mode, it will automatically change the color of my user interface to that color. That lets me know that I'm in play mode. And the reason I do that is because if you're in play mode and you make a change to something in the inspector, when you exit play mode, those values will go away. You lose those changes. So I like to know when I'm in play mode so I don't accidentally do that. Continuing our tour of the editor, down here is our project view. This is basically everything that's in our project. Everything that we create, we're going to put under this assets folder. And so you can see we've got scenes, settings, and then this is a universal render pipeline setting file. Uh, one thing I like to do is down here, you see this little slider. I like to display things with just the names. Uh, unless I need to zoom in and see the icons for some reason, I usually like to just display it like this. So I usually move that slider all the way to the left. Uh, if we go into our scenes folder, you can see here's our sample scene. And I'm going to go ahead and rename this and call this Beam Rider. And then we'll have to reload the scene. And there we go. And I didn't save my scene, so we lost that little cube that we created. So let's go into our main camera again, go down to environment, set that solid color back to black. And I'm going to hit Control S to save the scene. So those changes are now saved. Under our assets folder, we're going to want to create a bunch more folders. And I'm going to go ahead and do that now. And this is not necessary, but I like to organize my projects in a way that makes sense to me so that as I'm adding new things or if I'm trying to find something I've already added, I know where to go look. So we're going to create a bunch of folders here. So you do that by in here under assets, you right click, create folder, and we're going to create one for animations. We're going to create one for art. We're going to create one for materials. We're going to create one for prefabs. So prefabs are prefabricated objects that we've created and we save a prefab of them so we can instantiate more of them later on. Uh, we've already got scenes. Uh, we've already got settings. We're going to add one for sounds. And I'm going to create one for user input. Go ahead and put a space in there. So now I've got a good folder structure for our game. So now it's time to import some assets that we're going to use for this game. We're going to import some art and some sound effects, and we're going to import a font, which reminds me I need to create a folder here for fonts. 
So the assets that we're going to use in this game, most of them I got from a site called itch.io. Some of them I got from freesound.org. And I also got a font from this site, 1001freefonts.com. All the assets can be downloaded from this GitLab repository. And I'll put a link in the description. Uh, to save you some time. But if you look at the README file in this repository, it shows you where I got all of the different assets. And if you want to go give attribution to these authors, uh, like if you want to use these assets in your own projects, uh, that's always a good thing to do. And I believe that this font is free for personal use. So if you want to use it commercially, I think you need to reach out to the author and see about how you would license that font. So once you've downloaded these things, which I have done here, uh, we can import them into our game. So we'll start with the sound effects. All you have to do is grab these and drag them into your sounds folder, just like so. Okay, and if we were to go and open that up, you can see there's our sound effects and we can even sample those sounds. I actually see that my desktop audio is um, apparently muted in my record in my recording here. There we go. So you can sample these sounds. You can even set this little thing here to autoplay. So, so those are sounds that we're going to use in our game. Now the art, uh, I believe that these files are zipped in a compressed folder. So in order to use those, um, we're not going to be able to drag them directly into the project. So I'll show you how that works. If I open up this zip file here and I go into the PNG folder, um, I'm going to use this one, explosion one. I don't think I can just drag these in here. It won't let me do that. So what I have to do move this off screen for a second, is I right click in here and say show an explorer. Okay, that will open up a new explorer window. Now, I can just drag those directly into the explorer window. And they will show up here in there. Now these are 16, I believe these are 16 bits. Let me show this in explorer again. If we go into paint, if I say open with paint, you click resize pixels, oh, they're 550 pixel images. So what we're going to want to do is select all of these, come over here to max size and just say 512 and hit apply. And you can see it doesn't affect the quality at all, but this is going to give us a nice animated explosion. Um, that we can use. In fact, I'm going to show you how to create that explosion. If we just take all these, we have them all highlighted, and we drag them into the scene, it will prompt us to create an animation. And we come up here into Assets, Animations, and we can call this Explosion. It will create in our Animations folder an Explosion Animator and the animation itself. So we're going to show you how we use this later on when we go actually add our animation effect. But there you go. We actually have an explosion animation just that easy, just from dragging in some sprites. So continuing to bring in some art, show an expo uh, explorer, open that up in the art folder. So if we come up here under art and we look at the game creators pack, under graphics pack, we're going to want the shooter boss sprite. So we'll drag that into this folder here. And I'm going to change my view here to be large icons. So there's our shooter boss sprite. And we're also going to want the shooter sprite sheet. So drag that in. And that gives us that shooter sprite sheet. The only other assets left to be brought in are our font. So go up here to the fonts folder and select that window again. And just grab that, drag him into there. Now with a font, 
you select the font and you right click and say create and then text mesh pro font asset and that will create a text mesh pro font and I don't know why that was complaining about an error so I've mentioned my console is where you can see um, different log messages and it's displaying an error about something um, with the font creator but I'm just going to clear that. I don't think that's going to be a problem. So when we create some text mesh pro text fields, we can use this font and I think it's a pretty cool looking font. All right. So that is the assets that we're going to use in this game. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to actually arrange my unity editor layout for a way that I think it'd be easier for me to work with, especially when I'm recording a video for a tutorial. So I like to rearrange my interface a little bit. And part of the reason is as I edit a video, I have to zoom in on the screen so you can see what I'm doing. And if things are far apart on the screen, that also means I need to pan back and forth, uh, which just makes video editing take a lot longer. So to solve that problem, I'm gonna take my inspector and I'm gonna dock it over here next to our hierarchy. So as I pick something in here, I can see it right next to it. And if I have to go back and forth, I'm not having to pan the screen back and forth. I'm going to take my project and dock it underneath of my hierarchy. And I'm just going to zoom down my console so I don't need that much space. That is still complaining about, oh, I know what's wrong here. Uh, we will fix this when I actually import my Text Mesh Pro Essentials. Um, we can do that right now. If I was to go and create um, well, that's the next part of my rearranging here. Um, I want to actually arrange uh, some things in our hierarchy. So let's create for our camera and light. I'm going to create an empty game object, right click, create empty. And I'm going to call this camera and light. And I'm just putting some dashes before it and after it so it'll stand out. I'll select both the camera and the light and drag it into there. So now I'm organizing my hierarchy a little bit. I want to create a couple of more groups here. Right click, create empty object, and this will be background. Again, right click, create empty managers. And right click, create empty UI. And then what I was talking about with Text Mesh Pro. Under UI, I'm going to create a Text Mesh Pro field. And here, this little window pops up Import TMP Essentials. So we're going to do that. And we're going to import TMP examples and extras. And when that's done, I will just close this window. So that added some extra stuff to our project. Uh, we don't really need to worry about that, but now if I pick this text object here and I go into the inspector, you can see it's using this liberation font. If we go to our fonts folder, I can drag my arcade font right in there. Oops. There's something it does not like about that. Let me go ahead and delete that font. And let's do this again. Right click, create, text mesh pro font asset. Select that text field. There we go. So I think because I tried to create that font before I had installed the Text Mesh Pro Essentials, it didn't like that. But there we go. We've got this new text in a beautiful uh, arcade font. Um, I'm going to delete that for now. But we have our UI group here. So as we begin to add UI elements to the game, that's where we're going to put them. Okay, I do want to adjust some of the art assets that we pulled in. Uh, if we go to the Shooter Boss Sprite, uh, you can see that its max size is 2048 and its pixels per unit is 100. If we were to right click on this and say Show and Explorer, and then right click and say Open with Paint, Resize Pixels, 
you can see that that is a 64 by 64 pixel image. So obviously we don't need that to be so big. So let's make that 64 max. And then pixels per unit will also set to 64. We'll hit apply. That means that in game unit terms, this sprite will take up one unit. All right. So his scale is one. That is one unit. And that will make it easy as we put things into the game with the coordinates and we want to determine um, how big things should be relative to other things in the game. We don't have to do a bunch of manipulation because that's just one unit. Uh, the other thing I want to do is our sprite sheet here is currently just a single image. Uh, it's not a bunch of individual sprites. So we're going to go up to sprite mode and say multiple and hit apply. Uh, the other thing I want to do is we don't really need that guy to be so big either. Um, and I'm going to just reduce this to 256 max size. And these individual sprites are only 16 pixels. So we're going to change pixels per unit to be 16 and hit apply. Now we still only have one big individual image. So we need to go into the sprite editor and we want to say slice, make sure automatic is set and click slice. And now we've got these individually sliced sprites. Now it's not perfect. There's a few that like this should be one image here. This should be one image. And you can see that it's, it's, split it up into like four different images here and this this guy's got some of this guy stuck in them so it's definitely not perfect but all the images that we care about using in our game are fine so we click apply and you'll notice that this image here has changed it's got this little arrow next to it now and if i expand it you see all of the little individual sprites from that sprite sheet so if I was to drag, say, this guy into the scene, there, and you can see that's one unit because we set it to be 16 by 16 for the unit size. All right, I think that's all the manipulation we need to do for the images. The next thing we're going to do is start implementing the beam effect where we have that beam that moves toward the player um, and will begin to give us that 3D effect that our friend recommend, who recommended the game actually pointed out. Okay, the next thing we want to do is actually start replicating some of that Beam Rider game functionality. Um, and to help me out with that, I've actually captured a screenshot from the original uh, video that I was watching on YouTube. I'm going to drag that into our scene here. And then I'm actually going to come up here to UI Canvas and I'm under canvas here. Actually, I'm going to come up here to background and I'm going to create a UI image and I'm going to drag that screenshot into the image here. And then I'm going to rect transform. I'm going to click this little box up here. I'm going to hold down the alt key and I'm going to click this and that will fill it to the whole screen. So this is a screenshot from the game and we're going to want to be replicating these beams. We're also going to want to be replicating these hash marks that are going up toward like an imaginary vanishing point here. Uh, and we're going to want to use this color for our um, font for displaying the score and the sector number uh, and so forth. And we're going to arrange things very similar to the way they did. So we're going to have the number of enemies remaining until the boss. We're going to have our torpedoes listed here. Uh, and our number of player lives down here. So a little bit about the game if you're not familiar with it. Enemies will go back and forth up here and then they will start flying down toward the player. They'll be shooting at the player. The player can shoot back. The player's projectiles, the normal projectiles, will only go maybe this far. There will be a boss after you've killed the last enemy before the boss arrives. The boss will go from right to left across the screen here, kind of like the saucer in Space Invaders. And in order to kill the boss, you need to hit it with a torpedo. But you have a limited number of torpedoes. Um, and the torpedoes will go all the way to where the boss is. But if they hit something else, you've wasted a torpedo. So you got to kind of time it right to hit him without hitting something else. 
So that's a little bit about how the game will work. There will be these beams that will go from here down towards the player. They're going to speed up as they get closer to the player. And that will be a continuous stream of these beams to make it look like you're flying over sort of a landscape here. And these hash marks don't move. They're just going to be part of the static background. So using this image as a reference, let's create our beam. But before we do that, I want to do some more rearranging here. Uh, for one thing, I want to take my game view and I want to dock it underneath my scene view. And ooh, I don't like the way that looks. So this is my scene view. This is my game view. This is the UI. Um, and this is what my camera sees um, for things that are not UI elements. And I don't like the way this little black box is sticking out there. So I'm actually going to go into my background here and delete that canvas. And I'm going to redrag this reference image under background as just an image. And I am going to look at its scaling thing here. And I'm going to scale it to fit the entire screen. There, that looks a lot better in both views. And I'm going to go ahead and rename this to reference image. The next thing I want to do is create a bunch of physics layers. So you can see that this guy is currently on the default layer, which is fine. I want to create a bunch of other layers that we can assign things to and let the physics engine determine what objects interact with other objects instead of us having to do a bunch of comparisons and code. So if we expand this layer drop down, you can see we've already got a few layers. Um, we are going to add several more. First of all, I'm going to add one called beam and the beam is going to go on this. Uh, we're also going to want one for the player, the player projectiles. Uh, we're going to want one for enemies and an enemy projectile. Uh, let's see, we're going to want one for a barrier. So we're going to have a couple of different barriers. There's going to be a barrier um, that when enemy ships hit at the bottom of the screen, they'll go back up to the top of the screen um, in what I'm going to call an idle state. Uh, basically, an idle state, I'm going to have enemies, they'll just go back and forth up here while they're idle. And then when they go into attack state, they'll start coming down toward the player. Uh, but when they hit a barrier down here, they're going to jump back up to idle state. Uh, we're also going to want a barrier for projectiles. So I mentioned that the player projectiles will only go so far. And the easiest way for me to implement that is just when they hit an invisible barrier here, they'll just die. <laughs> so I'm going to create a barrier here and put it on the projectile barrier layer. Uh, we're going to want a layer for torpedoes. And I'm going to create a torpedo barrier layer. I'm going to go ahead and put spaces in these guys. It doesn't hurt. And it makes it easier to read. Uh, let's see. We're also going to want a boss layer and a boss barrier. So again, the boss is going to go from right to left across the screen. And when he hits the boss barrier, he'll die. Um, instead of me having to check, oh, what position is the boss at? Is he to the left of this position? You know, I don't have to worry about any of that. He hits the barrier, he dies. Um, so using physics layers to simplify my game logic, um, I'm a big fan of that. Okay, so we got our physics layers set up. It's time to start working on our beam. So that's this blue line that's going to move across the screen to make it look like the player is flying over some 3D terrain. Uh, in order to make a beam look like this, we need to create a material for it. So let's go into our materials folder, right click, create. And if you scroll down here, you see material. And we're going to call this beam material. And for our shader, we're going to go under universal render pipeline, simple lit. And then for this color here under surface inputs base map, select this little eyedropper and we're going to pick that color 
from our little screenshot here. And that is our beam material. So now that we've got that, we can in our hierarchy, right click 3D object cube, and we're going to call this beam, and we're going to assign it to the beam layer. All right, and we don't need a box collider, so let's remove that component. And now you can see it here in our hierarchy. And by the way, I turned off gizmos. You probably see this camera and light superimposed over it in the scene view. If you want to turn that off, you can just turn off your gizmos there. And I'm going to drag that beam material right into the scene view on top of the cube. And now the cube is the correct color. And if we select our scaling tool here, we can scale this guy out. And so looking at this, I'm thinking maybe an 18 would be enough to cover the whole screen. And we're going to set it at zero on the X offset. And for our scaling on the Y, let's try 0 0.1. And I think that looks pretty good. If we toggle off our reference image, there you can see that little beam right there. Okay, so we have a beam. And I'm going to drag that into the prefabs folder so that we'll be able to instantiate new beams later. And let's move it up to the top of the screen here. So if we pick our little move tool, we can drag that all the way up. And I'm thinking maybe a three looks good. And I will override to apply that to our prefab. It looks like it says there's nothing to override. Let me look at this. It did not change it. So let's go ahead and save that there. So if I was to delete that and bring a new beam into the scene, it would create it up at the top of the screen. Okay, now we're going to create a script that will move that beam towards the player. So let's go into our scripts folder. Oh, it looks like I didn't create one. So under assets, Let's right click, create, folder, scripts, and then I will double click that to open it up. And we're going to right click, create, C sharp script, and I'm going to call this beam mover. All right, and Unity had to think about that for a second. And I'm going to select our beam here. I'm going to drag that beam mover script onto it and still hasn't finished compiling. So Unity's acting a little slow here. I might need to reboot my computer. All right, so I will select Beam, drag that script onto there. There we go. So there is our Beam Mover script. Now I can either double click here or here to open that script up in the Unity, uh, I'm sorry, in my source code editor, which in my case is JetBrains Rider. So you see it's thinking, and it actually opened this window up off screen. Now, because Ryder says I've never opened this solution before, it wants to know if I can trust it, and I will say yes. Um, if you are using um, Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, you'll open up a different editor than I am. Uh, I am using JetBrains Rider. I really like it. It has great Unity integration, and I got a free license for it, which is the main reason I use it. I'm going to zoom in so you can see better what I'm doing. Now, your script is going to look a little bit different than mine. I actually edited my script templates um, to remove all the extra boilerplate code that is automatically added when you create a new script. So there's a using statement that I remove. There's some stuff in here that gets removed that I've removed that would have been created automatically. Um, you don't need all of that boilerplate code and you can delete it to look like what mine looks like if you want to. It's not gonna hurt anything if it's there. I'm also caching my transform for performance reasons and I have a whole video on the Great Nerd War of 2023 where we debated whether this is even necessary to do or whether there's any benefit. It's not necessary. I will say that right out. It's not necessary. But I do believe that there is some benefit to doing it. Others disagree. You don't need to do it, but I'm going to do it in this tutorial. So I'm caching my transform in the awake method. Um, now I'm going to add some serialized fields to the top of this script. 
Uh, the first is going to be a float for my initial move speed. And I'm going to default it to something like 0.05. I want these beams to start moving slowly at the top of the screen, but then I want them to gradually get faster and faster as they're getting towards the player um, so that you get that illusion of 3D. Uh, let's see, I also want to add an increment for our scale and speed and make that something really small. And I'm gonna give it the bottom position when it reaches this position, we're going to despawn de it. Uh, I could use a collider and a barrier, which is probably what I should do, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it like this. Um, I'm going to have a Boolean property. This is true or false. I'm going to call it reached bottom. And this will be true. This is what's called an expression body method. Uh, this little equal greater than sign. Basically, it's saying to execute this code. If transform position.y is less than bottom position. So the y goes from a low value to a high value. So the higher the value, the higher you are in the y position. So we're going down. So if we're below our bottom position, we've reached the bottom. Now I mentioned that this is an expression body method. Um, I could refactor this to be a statement body. Um, and if I did that, um, it would actually refactor this to, to do something like this. Right. Um, but I am going to use an expression body property, which looks like that. So it's just a simpler shorthand way of doing the same thing. I'm going to also in awake cache our move speed or initialize our move speed, I should say, to be our initial move speed. And this variable doesn't exist, so I'm going to put my cursor over it and hit Alt Enter, Create Field, and you can see it added that field there. Um, the next thing we're going to want to do is actually move this guy in our update method. So update is a method that's called every frame. So if we hover over this, Rider will tell us, update is called every frame if the mono behavior is enabled. And by the way, awake is called when an enabled script instance is being loaded. So this is only ever called once. Um, and so we're new, doing our initialization in here when this script is first being loaded. This is gonna be called every frame by the Unity Game Engine game loop. So what do we wanna do in here? Well, one thing, Later on, we're going to say, if not playing, just return. Right now, we don't have any game state. So we're going to put a comment in there. In fact, I'm going to make that a to do. And we'll do that later. That's a special kind of comment. So if we go down to to do, you can see here's my list of to do items. Um, if I expand that, you can say in beam mover, I had this to do, if not playing, just return. Okay, so what we do want to do is we want to move our beam, and that doesn't exist yet. We want to enlarge our beam. So I want it to get a little bit bigger as it gets closer to the player too. Now that does not happen in the video that I showed you, but I think it will enhance the 3D effect um, that we have when that beam is moving towards the player, if it gets a little bit bigger as it gets closer. Uh, and then I want to say if reached bottom, destroy game object. That's how we will despawn it. So put my cursor over this, Alt enter, create method. And you can see we've got this new method down here. And it added this exception by default. And up here, we will do the same thing to create a method for move beam. And I will delete that exception. So in move beam, I wanna take our transform position and I want to add to it vector 3 dot down times our move speed times time dot delta time. So what is time dot, oh, this needs to be plus equals. What is time dot delta time? It is an interval in seconds from the last frame to the current one. So basically, we want to smooth this movement out so that it is frame independent. 
frame speed independent. So depending on your machine, um, your hardware, your graphics card, different things, your frame rate will be different from other people's machines. And we want this to look the same no matter what device you're playing on. So we will multiply this move speed by time that delta time. And so this will move at some fraction depending on how many uh, milliseconds have elapsed since the previous frame. And, and then we want to increment our move speed by our scale and speed increment. So this will make it so that our speed will gradually increase as it's moving toward the player. And I actually think that I want to also scale that by time dot delta time. Okay, now in enlarge beam, we want to do something simple, uh, similar. So we're going to declare a little variable here called local scale, and we're going to assign our transforms local scale to it. And then we're going to take the y position or the y value of our local scale, and we're going to increment it by that scale and speed increment times time dot delta time. And we're going to assign that back to our transforms local scale. Okay, so we've got move beam, we've got enlarge beam. All that's being done from our update method. Get rid of this extra line. Get rid of these extra using, state, using statements that rider at it for some reason. Go back into the Unity editor. And it's going to compile that script with the changes we just made. We select our beam, you can see these values are exposed by the inspector in the inspector. So if we go back and look at the script, these serialized fields take these private fields and expose them in the editor so that we can actually change them if we wanted to right here in the editor. Uh, I'm gonna go with these values for now and I am going to, on our game view, say play maximized. And when I hit play, this should go to full screen and we should see that beam move. It's moving very, very slowly. And I think the reason is because when I increment my move speed increment, I don't want this time dot delta time adjustment for this. So let me go back into Unity and give that another test. And by the way, I'm going to turn off my reference image. Let's see what that looks like. There it goes. So it moved from the top to the bottom, got a little bit bigger as it went, not noticeably bigger, but I think that is still pretty good uh, to give us that illusion that we're flying over something. Now, obviously, we don't want to just have one beam. We want to actually have a beam spark. So before I get too far into this, that beam mover reminded me that I need some kind of a game manager to manage game state so I can know if we're playing or not. Because this is going to have like a start screen and a game over screen. And we're also going to want to know, are we playing? And so these different components can know whether or not they should be animating things or doing different things. So to facilitate that under managers, I'm going to right click, create empty, and create a game manager object. And then under my scripts here, I'm going to create a new folder. I just like to organize things in folders. I'm going to call this managers. Double click in there, right click, create C sharp script game manager. And I like the way Unity gives it a special icon to let you know, hey, this is a game manager. Just inferring that from the name. So select our game manager game object, drag our game manager script, and double click to open that up in my writer editor. You would obviously have something different. Uh, in this case, we don't need a transform, so we'll delete that. I want to add some events to this. Now, one thing I want to do, though, is I want this to be a singleton. A singleton is basically an object that there can only ever be one instance of it. And I want to make sure that I can access this instance from other components 
without having to inject them into it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new base class and I'm going to call it singleton mono behavior. I'm going to actually do it right in here. I'm going to say um, public class singleton mono behavior and it's going to be a generic class. So this will let me pass in any kind of type I want in my declaration and you'll see it when I implement it up here. Uh, so this will actually be a game manager singleton and it will derive from mono behavior where T is a mono behavior. So I can only create singletons of type mono behavior. Um, inside of there, I'm going to have a static T instance variable. And then I'm going to have a public static property like so. And the getter for this property is basically the first time you try and ask for this singleton. If it doesn't already exist, it's going to create one. So I'm going to say if instance is not equal to null, then just return this instance. Right? Um, otherwise, I'm going to see if one exists in the scene anywhere. So find object of type T and then say if that is not equal to null, return that instance. Otherwise, I'm going to create a new singleton object. It's just going to be a game object. Type of T dot name. And then I'm going to assign that to my instance variable by doing add component T. Okay, I think that will do that. And then I will just return my instance. That's probably the most confusing thing we're going to do in this tutorial. All right, now we want to have an awake method in here. And I actually want to make this protect it and virtual so that my derived classes can override it if they want to. And in here, I'm going to say if instance equals null or instance equals this, just return. Otherwise, this is a new instance of this type that I don't want and I'm going to destroy it. All right. And I'm going to get rid of this. And I'm going to hold my cursor over this, Alt Enter, and say move to singleton mono behavior dot CS. So it moved it into its own file. And what is this complaining about? It wants me to make it sealed. I'm not going to do that. Uh, let me go back into our game manager and we're going to change game manager um, to now instead of being a mono behavior, it's going to be a singleton mono behavior of type game manager. Okay, so now we can have an instance of our game manager outside of this class that I can reference from anywhere using that instance variable. And we're going to add some events to this guy. So in order to do that, I'm going to add the system namespace. And I'm going to say public event action. And so action came from system, which is why I needed to add that system namespace. And it's going to be an action of type game state. So another case of generic. And let's create a new class in here, public enum game state. So this is going to be an enumeration. And I'm going to have a few different variables in there, uh, values. I want to have waiting to start playing and game over and then i'm going to enter move to game state.cs so it moved that into its own file all right so i had this event action game state um, we're going to call this game state changed so basically every time the game state changes we're going to fire this event and i'm going to initialize it to be an empty delegate that way, if nobody has subscribed to it, we won't get an error if I try and invoke it. And I'm also going to add a 
public bool is playing. And that is going to be, actually, I think before I can add the bool, I need to add a game state. So let me do this. Let me say public game state, game state. And it's going to be a public property with a public getter, but a private setter. And then public bool is playing. And it's going to be an expression body method that returns um, game state equals playing. There. So I think that may be all that I need, except I want to initialize this guy um, to initially set the game state to be playing, just so that I can test my other stuff. We'll refactor this later, but I'm going to add a start method. And I'm just going to say that game state equals playing. That may be all I need to do to get this other stuff to work. So I go back into our beam mover and where I had this, if just playing, if not playing return, I'm going to say if game manager dot instance dot is playing. So if not playing return. That way we'll only move our beam if we're actually playing. So let's go back into our Unity editor and see if our beam still moves. And it does. So we did not break anything by doing that. All right, so here under background, I'm gonna right click, create empty, and I'm gonna call this beam spawner and I'm just gonna put that on the beam layer doesn't really matter and I'm going to under our scripts under managers I'm gonna right click create C sharp script beam spawner I'm let unity recompile that select our beam spawner object and drag that script right onto there and then double click to open that up in the editor zoom in and we do not need to cache our transform so i will delete that add a couple of serialized fields we're going to want a prefab for our beam and i will call this beam prefab and then a serialized field for the spawn interval. This is how often we want to spawn. And I'm going to default it to something really low. So every quarter of a second, we're going to spawn a new beam. We'll see how that works. Let's declare a variable here called next spawn time. And then we're going to add a bool should spawn beam. And this will be an expression body method that will return true if the game manager instance is playing and time dot time is greater than or equal to the next spawn time. All right. So now in our start method, I want to subscribe to that game state changed event that we created. So game manager dot instance dot game state changed we will subscribe to it by typing plus equals and giving it a name on game state changed and if i hover over that and i hit alt enter create method you can see that it created a new function called on game state changed and i'm just going to rename this parameter to game state and in here we're going to say if game state equals playing then we want to start spawning and in that start spawning method all I want to do is say next spawn time equals time dot time plus our spawn interval 
Okay, so now we want to add an update method. In an update, I want to say if should spawn beam spawn beam. Oops. That doesn't exist, so I'll put my cursor over there, alt right click, or alt enter, I'm sorry, alt enter, create method, spawn beam. And in spawn beam, we're gonna first of all reset the spawn time, which should be time dot time plus the spawn interval. And we are going to instantiate our beam prefab and we're going to make it a child of our transform. Now I'm not using a cache transform in this case because I'm not accessing any of the properties on this. Uh, I'm just passing this in so we can use this to make this beam a child of this transform. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want all these to be grouped in the hierarchy underneath of this object so I don't clutter up my hierarchy. And I will show you what that looks like. We go back into the Unity Editor. I'm going to delete our beam that we created here. We go up to our beam spawner. We need to assign our beam prefab. So we go down to our prefabs folder and drag that beam. Um, oh, do we not assign our... We need to add our script to this. So I say add component beam mover. Okay. So now go back to our beam spawner. We can drag that guy in there as our prefab. If I hit play, we should start spawning beams and they should start moving down the screen. There we go. Just like that, we've got that really cool, somewhat 3D looking terrain, if you want, that we're flying over. Nice. And if we uh, minimize this and look at our hierarchy, under beam spawner, we've got these beams. I'm going to turn off play maximized so we can watch that while we're playing. And you should see those beams go away at, when they hit the bottom. Right? So we're never going to have any more beams than this in the game. Okay, so moving right along here, uh, before I go any farther, I just want to make a little shameless plug. If you find these tutorials useful, do me a favor, click the like and subscribe button. It really does help me to grow my channel and I want to get this content in front of as many people as possible and maybe someday I can actually monetize my YouTube channel, which would be awesome. Uh, along those lines, if you'd like to support my efforts, uh, you could hop over to my coffee page. I'll put a link in the description and you could buy me a coffee. I would love that. You don't have to. Uh, if you want to continue to enjoy this content for free, that's perfectly fine too. Just wanted you to be aware that that's an option. Um, as you can imagine, it takes a lot of time and effort to make these videos. Uh, and if you wanted to show your support, that's one way you could do it. Uh, moving along, I want to enable this reference image and start working on these hash marks to kind of give us that 3D perspective, uh, just to increase that illusion of 3D. And I'm going to, under my background object here, I'm going to right click, create empty, and I'm going to call this hash marks. And I'm going to move that up above the reference image here. And I'm going to put that on the beam layer. And I'm going to, in here, right click, 3D object cube. So that gives me a nice, beautiful little cube. And once again, we're going to create a material. So, you know, we created a material for our beam. Let's create one for our hash marks. So uh, go into the materials folder here, right click, create material. And we're going to call this hash mark material and once again we're going to under universal pipeline select simple lit for our shader and then we're going to zoom in on this guy here use the eyedropper to go grab that and that will give me actually i think i'm going to grab that one that looks pretty good all right so we have a material for our hash mark let's rename hash mark hash mark and I am going to drag that material onto it. Now let's zoom out again and we're going to 
pick our move tool and we're going to move this over one of these hash marks here and I'm going to scale it. Um, I think, let me just try some values here. 0 0.25 for the width and 0 0.005 for the height. And I don't know why I'm changing the collider. In fact, we don't need a collider. Let's go ahead and remove that. Expand our transform. 0 0.25, 0 0.05. So I think that's pretty good for our hash mark. Pick our move tool. And let's position this guy right there. And then I'm going to stop talking and I'm just going to go ahead and duplicate these and position them over these reference image hash marks. And I will time lapse this so it will go fast. Um, you can, of course, pause the video if you want to go ahead and do this yourself if you're following along. So here we go. Okay, so we've got all our hash marks and they're all grouped nicely under this little hash marks thing. If I turn off my reference image, this is what we've got. And I'll go ahead and say play maximized, hit play, and let's see what that looks like. There it is. I think that looks pretty good. Uh, except I do want the beams to appear over top of the hash marks. And that's super simple to do. I go up to my hash marks parent object and I'm just going to move it forward on the Z axis. So forward is like into the screen. Uh, if I go positive on the Z and negative on the Z would be moving it towards you away from the screen. So if this was a 3D game. Uh, that's the way that would look. In fact, if I switch over here, um, and if I was to move this, you can see how they move. So we want that to be one in that Z axis, switch back to 2D mode, go ahead and hit play. And those hash marks should be behind the beams and they are. The next thing I want to do is add our player ship. So let's come over to our hierarchy, right click, create empty, and we will call this player ship. And we are going to drag a sprite onto him. So if we go into our art folder and we scroll down to the shooter sprite sheet, let's take this one here, the fourth one down, and just drag him onto the player ship. And there he is. And we'll take the parent object and drag it down to the bottom of the screen. So it looks like something like 4.5 would be good. All right. And we're going to want to give him a couple of objects that or components rather that will allow him to interact with the enemy projectiles and other enemies. So we are going to click add component and we're going to add a rigid body 2D. But we don't want this to interact with physics. So we'll set this to kinematic. And then we're going to add a box collider 2D and we're going to set that to trigger is trigger. And if we select this bounding volume editor here, you can see that it perfectly bounds our ship. If we wanted to, we could have added a polygon collider that would have perfectly conformed to the shape of the sprite, but that would be a little bit overkill. We don't really need to do that. I want to create a prefab for this guy. So we'll go into our prefabs folder and drag that right into there. And so now if I was to delete, to delete the ship and just drag a new one in there, you see it's got everything that we had created him with the right position. Oh, one thing we do want to change though, is we want him to be negative one on the Z. Um, and let me save that scene. I'm pretty sure that didn't take, I don't know why that doesn't always take. If I double click that, it didn't. So negative one. So now if I was to drag one into the scene and the reason I want him to be negative one 
on the Z is because I want him to be a front of in front of the beams. One other thing I want to do here is put him on the player layer and all his children as well. So last time, drag him into the scene. Um, he's at negative one. He's on the player layer. All that looks good. All right. Now, one thing I want to do is now that we've got all these physics layers, we want to configure which layers can interact with what other layers. So you go into edit project settings and here under physics 2d you've got this matrix and i am going to turn off all the ones that we don't care about like for instance this boss barrier we only want it to collide with the boss so i am going to go ahead and turn all these off and i will fast forward through this so you don't have to sit here and watch me meticulously click each and every one of these Okay, so that was a little bit tedious, but I only have to do that once when I first set this up. Um, so let me look at this here. The boss will collide with torpedoes. Torpedo barrier will collide with torpedoes. The boss will also collide with the boss barrier. Um, player projectiles will collide with enemies. Um, oh, that's projectile barrier. Sorry. Um, they want to collide with the player projectile. The enemies will collide with the barrier, the torpedo, and that is it. And I believe that the player projectile is already colliding with enemies. Is that right? Yes, so that's good. Um, enemies also collide with the player. So these all look good. Uh, it's a little bit tedious to set up, but once you've done it, you don't have to worry about it going forward. And this will handle interactions for us so we don't have to like compare tags and all that kind of stuff in our code. Let's hit play now and see how that looks. Uh, it should be over top of the beams. And it is. So it looks like that ship is flying over some somewhat 3D looking terrain. Nice. Uh, the next thing we're going to want to do is add the ability to have user input so that we can move this player back and forth and fire projectiles. So in order to do that, we need to add the user input system. In order to add user input, we need to import the package for the new Unity input system. I'm going to be using the new Unity input system for this game. So if we go into Window Package Manager and... We don't want packages in project. We want to pick Unity Registry. And if we just search for input, you can see input system. We want to click install and wait for Unity to install that. Okay, Unity has finished installing that and it pops up this little dialog saying the project's using a new input system, but native platform backends for the new input system are not enabled in player settings. So basically it wants to restart the editor to enable those. So I will click yes, let Unity do that. Okay. And you can see it is restarting the Unity editor and loading everything up again. Sorry that these processes aren't particularly fast, but we only have to do these really once at the beginning of setting up the project. Uh, and then it's just a matter of creating components and writing code. And there we go. I will go ahead and close the package manager. Now I want to create under our managers group here, I want to create a new object and call it user input. So I will right click, create empty user input and I'm going to add a component to that player input and that would not have been available if we had not installed that new unity input system uh, I want to create a new action so right now there is a default action but I want to create a new one just for our game so I'm going to say create actions and I'm going to put this in that user input folder and it's going to call it beamrider.inputactions. Okay. And if we go into that user input folder and double click that, 
and open it off screen, we basically get this window right here. Now, we don't care about this UI, so I'm going to go ahead and delete that. So under player, this is the action map we're going to use. We've got move, look, and fire. We're not going to use a look action, so I'm going to delete that. So we have move and we have fire. And it basically has different types of inputs. It's got a gamepad, which we're going to keep. It's also got keyboard, W-A-S-N-D, which we're going to keep. Um, we don't need this XR controller, and we don't need this joystick controller. Um, and for left stick, this is only enabled for gamepad. This is only enabled for keyboard and mouse, so that's all good. So if we look at fire, we got right trigger, that's good, keep that. We got left mouse, that's good. I'm going to go ahead and delete all these. And we're going to add a new one for torpedo. So this is going to fire our normal projectile, but we also have torpedo. So up here under actions, we'll click this little plus button, and we're going to call this torpedo. And let's add a new binding for it. So right here under path, uh, we're going to drop down gamepad, and I'm going to say left trigger. And we're only going to use that for the gamepad uh, schema. And then we're going to add another binding. So this little one, this one here adds actions. This one adds a binding. So we're going to add another one. And we're going to use the space bar to fire torpedoes. So under path, I can click listen and hit space and just select space keyboard. And that's only going to be for the keyboard and mouse scheme. Um, so that is good. But hey, maybe we also want to use the right mouse. So I'm going to add another binding and then come over here and say, listen, I'm going to click the right mouse, right button mouse, and that's only for keyboard and mouse. So now you can fire torpedoes either with the right mouse button, the space bar, or the left trigger on the gamepad. I want to add one more action though, and that is to quit the game. Uh, and you'll be able to quit either by hitting escape on the keyboard or the X button on the gamepad, which actually on the gamepad they call it button west. On an Xbox controller it would be the X. But we're going to click a new action up here. We're going to call this quit. So for binding, I want to go out of this gamepad, go back here. I want to pick keyboard and then escape right there. There we go. Keyboard and mouse. So now we can escape with the, we can quit with the escape key and then we're going to add one more. Um, and I'm going to actually tell it to listen this time. And I'm going to hit the X button on my gamepad. And so I could either select Xbox controller or gamepad. I'm just going to pick gamepad button West and check that. So now we've got all of our action maps defined for this, this player, all of our actions defined for this player action map. And I'm going to save the asset and I'm going to check auto save. So if we came in and added any more, it would automatically save. All right. So what we're going to want to do is add a script to this player ship. And I'm going to go ahead and delete this and always work against the prefab here. We're going to add a script for this player ship. Uh, and it's going to listen for events on that input controller. And so by the way, I want to show you this on the input controller. Um, actually, if we go back to our user input component, we have this configured for send messages. And these are the messages it will currently send. And it's always going to correspond to the actions that we added. So we have a move action, so there's on move events. We have a fire action, so there's on fire. We have a torpedo action, so there's on torpedo. And we have a quit action, so there's on quit. We can subscribe to those events and just be notified whenever those events occur. Uh, another thing I have here is it's set to auto switch. We could specifically pick a scheme, so we have keyboard and mouse and we have gamepad. This will automatically switch to the scheme based on what input it detects. So if we hit a key, it's going to use the keyboard 
um, scheme. If we hit something on the game pad, it's going to use the game pad scheme, and it does that all automatically for us under the covers. So let's go into our scripts folder and let's create a new script for our player. And we are going to call that player ship. And double click to open that up in the editor. Okay, so this is our basic empty script that just caches our transform. All the boilerplate's been deleted because I edited my script template. I have a whole nother video on how to do that, by the way. Um, so let's go ahead and add a bunch of serialized fields that we're going to need for this guy. Uh, first off, we want some floats. We want our move speed, which I will default to 10. Um, I like to add a little formatting. A move limit which is how far we can move left and right. A fire delay. So we don't want to be able to spam the fire key. Um, basically what we want is that you would um, have a little bit of a delay between each fire. So you can't just spam it and, and have an unlimited number of projectiles flying out as fast as you can press the button. Um, we want a prefab for our pro projectile, which does not exist yet. Uh, we're also going to want a projectile for a torpedo. And we're going to want some audio clips for our sounds. So audio clip. We want a fire sound and a torpedo sound. Okay. And then I want to add a little transform to our object for the position of where the projectiles will come out. And I'm going to call that gun. So this would be a transform called gun. Okay, and we've got our transform field here. Uh, I want to add some other variables. So let's add a float for fire time and torpedo fire time. And we're also going to want to know if there are any torpedoes left. Um, which is something we're going to have to add to the game manager. So let me do that. I'm going to show you a neat trick. I'm going to say int torpedoes expression body method, and it's going to return game manager dot instance dot torpedoes. That doesn't exist. So I'm going to put my cursor over here and hit alt enter, and I say create property torpedoes. And there it created it right there on our game manager. Now I'm going to add a to do here. Uh, refactor this when we implement torpedoes. And that will show up down here in our to do's. Right? All right, so back in our player ship, um, I want to have a can fire Boolean that tells me if I can fire. So can fire will be an expression body method that says if time dot time is greater than or equal to fire time. But not only that, game manager dot instance dot is playing. So we don't want to be able to fire if we're not playing. Um, can fire torpedo. So can fire torpedo. Um, basically, we want to say if torpedoes is greater than zero, let's do this. Say game manager dot instance dot is playing and torpedoes is greater than zero and time dot time is greater than or equal to torpedo fire time. Now, one thing I want to do, since we're calling this more than once, I'm going to add a little shortcut here and call it is playing. Make that an expression body method. And I'm just going to take this whole little thing here, cut it, paste it. And down here, I'm just going to replace that with is playing. Just to make these lines a little bit shorter. Okay. That's coming along. Um, now, one thing we want to do 
we want our user input to have a script on it that handles when those controls are pressed. And we want them to fire events that we can subscribe to from classes like this. All right, so let's go back out into Unity. And I'm going to add this playership script to our playership prefab. So go into prefabs, playership. I can just say add component playership. And there it is. We currently don't have any of these. But while we're in here, let's go ahead and create our gun. So I'm going to say create empty gun. And we want to position that. So let's double click that. Zoom in. Select our move tool. And let's just move that up in front of the nozzle there. <laughs> and then on our player ship, we can drag that right into that little serialized field. Um, what do we want to use for our audio clips while we're in here? Um, we know that we're going to want a fire sound and a torpedo sound. So we go into our sounds folder. We've already dragged these guys in here. I think that can be good for our regular fire sound. And that can be for our torpedoes. So I'm going to pick this guy here. I'm going to drag this guy onto here and this guy onto there. So now we've got our audio clips configured for the player ship. We don't have any way to play those sounds yet, but at least they're there as part of the definition. Now let's go back to our hierarchy here and we got this user input object. We want to create a script for it. So under scripts, let's create, I'm going to put that under managers, create C sharp script and we will call this user input. And I'm going to select the user input game object, wait for that to finish compiling drag that script onto there, and then we will open it up in the Unity editor, or I'm sorry, in the source code editor. So we don't need a transform, get rid of all that. We are going to want the input system. So using Unity engine dot input system. So we're going to want to create some events that other classes can subscribe to. But first, we want this to be a singleton. So the way we do that is instead of deriving from mono behavior, we will say singleton mono behavior of type user input. There it goes. So now we will have an instance variable that other classes can reference to subscribe to these events. So the first event I want and I need to install the system namespace. So we want an action input value. And we're going to call this on move received and initialize it to an empty delegate. Let's add another one here. Let's add on fire pressed and on torpedo pressed and on quit pressed. All right, and then I just want to have a public vector two to expose the move input. And that will have a public getter and a private setter. So we're going to add those event handlers, those message handlers that we saw when we were looking at the, the input action. So remember there's move, quit, fire, torpedo, and they will call on move, on quit, on fire, on torpedo. So let's add on move and it will pass in an input value. And what we want to do is set our move input that we've defined up here to be value.get vector2. And this needs to be a capital G. All right, and then we want to fire that event on move received value. And this needs to be a void. Okay, so we've got that handler. Let's do on fire. These are just going to be expression body methods. So on fire 
we'll simply call the on fire pressed event on torpedo we'll call the on torpedo pressed event and then on quit we'll call the on quit pressed event not quite pressed quit okay so there we have configured our input system let's go back into our player ship script so our player ship wants to subscribe to those events so we're going to add a start method and we want to say user input dot instance dot on fire pressed plus equals on fire pressed and user input dot instance dot on torpedo pressed plus equals on torpedo pressed i will put my cursor over here alt enter create method delete that exception alt enter create method delete that exception i did the bottom one first because it's going to create this function directly under here and i want fire to come before torpedo press that's the only reason i did that okay um when we destroy ourselves we want to unsubscribe from those events so i will copy these paste them and change this plus to a minus all right let's add an update method so i like i like to put the unity callbacks before my functions unless they're public functions that can be called from outside in which case i put all the public stuff up front up at the top so before on fire press i want to create an update function and this is where we're going to handle our movement so i want to say if user input dot instance dot move input dot x is greater than zero f and our transform.position.x is less than our move limit, then I want to say transform.position plus equals vector3.right times our move speed times time.delta time. And then just return. If we're moving right, we can't be moving left. <laughs> All right, and then I want to say if user input dot instance dot move input dot x is less than zero and our transform position dot x is greater than negative move limit. So remember our move limit was eight. So if we're greater than negative eight, we can move left. So we will say transform.position.x plus equals vector3.left times move speed times time.delta time. Except we don't want dot x. All right. Curious what Ryder is suggesting here. Convert to switch statement. Nah, that's all right. Sometimes Ryder thinks it's being really helpful and smart, but the, su the suggestions that it suggests aren't always what I would do. So I'm just going to leave my implementation the way it is. Let's go back out into the Unity Editor. We're going to drag a player ship into the scene, hit play, and just see if we can move back and forth. Look at that. I'm using the gamepad, by the way. This is with the keyboard, and it ignores up and down movement because we're not doing anything with those. Nice, player movement is working. Let's create a projectile for the player ship to shoot. So I'm going to right click, create empty, and I'm going to call this player projectile. And we're going to go into our art folder and into this shooter sprite sheet, expand that out. And I'm just going to hit the down arrow until I see the one I want, which is that one right there. And I'm going to drag that onto that player projectile like so. 
I do want to put him at negative one on the Z layer, um, on the Z axis, and I want to select the player projectile physics layer and apply that to all the children as well. We're going to give this guy a rigid body 2D. We're going to set it to kinematic. We are going to add a circle collider 2D and set it to is trigger. If we look at that, that fits nicely. Uh, and all that works automatically because these are one unit in size based on the way I set their pixels per unit when I define the sprite asset. Um, that's good. We're going to add a script for this guy. We're going to call this projectile. So we're going to use the same script, whether it's a player projectile or an enemy projectile. And I'm going to double click that to open that up in the editor. Zoom in. This is going to be a fairly simple script. We are going to say serialize field float movement speed, defaulting that to 10. I'm not really sure what I want that to be. And we got our transform. So let's see. In awake, we're caching our transform. That's good. An update. We want to set the transform's position adding vector 3.up times our movement speed times time dot delta time. That will handle moving it. Uh, one thing I want to do is I want to create an interface and I want to call this I hit barrier. I for interface. And it's going to have a public or it's just going to have a void method called hit barrier. Okay, and we're going to have this guy implement that interface. And I will let it automatically implement that missing function. And all we're going to do in here is say destroy game object. Now I'm going to put my cursor over this and hit Alt Enter, move to its own file. There we go. So we have an interface with hit barrier. Any class can implement that interface. So projectile implements it, and all we do in that is call destroy game object. Get rid of that. Let's go back out to the Unity editor. Let Unity recompile that script. And we're going to add that script to it. There we go. Now, one thing we want to do is give it a barrier to hit. Um, so as I believe I already told you, the player projectiles are only going to go up to about here, maybe. Um, so we want to put a barrier there. And let me go ahead and turn on our little reference image for reference. So I'm thinking somewhere about here would be a good place for that barrier. So I'm going to, under our background, right click, create empty, and I'm going to call this projectile barrier and actually do I want to do that or do I just want to create a cube I think I just want that to be a cube so let me delete this and under background 3d object cube and I'm going to call that projectile barrier and let's go ahead and set its width to be 18 since I know that goes across the whole screen. And its height, we can say 0 0.5, doesn't really matter. And I want to move it up. Uh, let's see, is that about where I want it? I'm going to say 2. All right, so now if the player projectile hits that, um, then it's going to get destroyed. Now, the way we're going to do that is we're going to create another script for the barrier. But first, I want to add some things to our barrier. Uh, we've already got a box collider, but it needs to be trigger. Um, we don't need a rigid body, but I'm going to add one anyway. And we're going to set it to... Why can't I add that? Oh, let me remove this. 
the, we need a box collider 2D. Box collider 2D, set it to is trigger. Rigid body 2D, set it to kinematic, kinematic. All right, we don't need a mesh renderer. Well, I'll just turn it off. Okay, so now that's where it would be, but we don't need to see it. Let's create our script. So under scripts, I will create a new script and I will call it barrier. All the different types of barriers will use this. And I will select that projectile barrier and I will drag the barrier script to it. Uh, one thing I want to do though, is I want to put that barrier on the right layer. So if I select that, go up here, I want projectile barrier. Okay, so going into our script, zoom in, we don't need to cache our transform. So on trigger, enter 2D. I'm going to change this to hit. Actually, I'm going to change that to other. And I'm going to try and grab from that other component, try get component. We're going to look for that I hit barrier interface and we're going to call it hit. So try get component using the generic version that takes this parameter, which is I hit barrier out is an out variable. So it will actually stuff the value in this variable and it's just var. So we're not giving it a type hit. So all I have to do in here is say hit, hit barrier. It's just that simple. Go ahead and get rid of that. Jump back out into Unity. Let that recompile. And this should just work, except that I don't have any projectiles flying up there. Let me just drag this projectile down here and see if it doesn't fly forward and then disappear when it gets to about where that barrier is. Looks like it moved awfully fast though. We can play with that later. Let me create a prefab for this projectile and then delete that. And we're gonna to wanna to modify our player ship to spawn that projectile when fire is pressed. So we've already got these methods here for on fire pressed and on torpedo press. So what we wanna do in here is say, if can fire, fire projectile. And I will go ahead and create that. Delete the exception. So we're going to reset our fire time when we fire. And that will be time dot time plus fire delay. And then if we have a fire sound, we want to play fire sound. We have one, but we don't have a way to play it yet. So we're going to have to create a sound manager soon. Uh, and then we are going to instantiate the projectile prefab. Did I not add that? We did not add that yet because it did not exist yet at the time. So let's go up to here and I'll put it at the top. Serialize field, projectile, projectile prefab, torpedo prefab. So we'll have one for each down here, instantiate projectile prefab, and we want to spawn it at the gun's position. So we'll say gun.position, and we don't care about the rotation because it's just a round object. So we'll just say quaternion.identity. All right, so that will instantiate. By the way, if you're seeing this, this is just something that um, Ryder does for me. Um, and you don't need to type this. This doesn't actually even exist in the code. Rider is just displaying this. So I had some people get confused in the past. They actually tried to type this stuff in and they didn't spell it correctly and they got errors. So yeah, don't type this little gray stuff in if you see that. Uh, for torpedoes, uh, we will say torpedo fire time equals time dot time plus fire delay. We will have to have a function to tell the game manager we fired a torpedo. 
Uh, the reason that we're going to do this is so that the game manager can fire an event to let everybody know, hey, a torpedo was fired. And basically the UI um, is going to subscribe to those events so it knows how many of those little torpedo indicators to display on the UI. For now, we're just going to create a method that doesn't do anything except throw an exception. Implement this. Go back into our player ship. Um, we are going to want to, if we have a missile sound or torpedo sound, then we want to play torpedo sound. I'm going to put to do's on these as well. And we're going to instantiate the torpedo prefab again at the gun's position using quaternion identity for the rotation. I don't know why that's not capitalized. Okay. All right. That should handle that. Let's go back into the Unity Editor. We will pick our player ship. And we will drag on our player projectile. We don't yet have a torpedo projectile. So for now, we'll just use the same one. And I'm going to override our changes and hit play. Oh, I should get rid of our reference image. Let me do that real quick. Hit fire. Boy, that's big. I don't think I want it to be that big. <laughs> but hey, it's working. I am firing a projectile. So if we go into our player projectile prefab, let's try and scale that down about half. Doesn't matter on the Z, but we'll do that. Hit play again. And if I press the left trigger, I'm firing a torpedo, but it's still the same projectile, same prefab, so it's the same thing. Let's go ahead and create a torpedo prefab. Uh, basically, I am going to duplicate this. Um, so I'm going to select that and hit Control D. And I'm going to rename that Torpedo. I think I just call it Torpedo. That would be fine. And let's double click that and see what we want to change in there. Obvious thing we want to change is the sprite. So I'm going to go into our art and just start hitting F down. There, down arrow. I think I like that one. Is that the one I want? I don't think I want that one. Let's see what else we got here. That one. Actually, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I'm actually making these child objects. What I want to do is select this sprite here, expand this, and then right here, drag that image in there. Okay. And maybe make this one bigger. And then make his speed a little bit slower. Put him on the torpedo layer. Save that. Okay. Um, I think I want to create a new barrier for the torpedo. So let's go to this projectile barrier. Control D to duplicate. Call it torpedo barrier. And then put it on the torpedo barrier layer. Okay. And then we're going to move it. So let's turn on his mesh renderer so we see him. And we want that one to go all the way up to the top. So let's pick our move tool here. And I think that'll do right about there. Hit save. So now if I hit play, I should be able to fire both torpedoes and project regular projectiles. So it's a regular projectile. Oh, it's still showing the same one because I didn't change my prefab. On the player ship, here for our prefab, let's take the torpedo and drag that under torpedo prefab. Hit play. Nice. And you can see the projectile stop there. The torpedo goes all the way. And it's a little bit slower. Okay. We've got projectiles. We got torpedoes. Let me just override here to save that change to our prefab. And I think we're good to start adding a sound manager to be able to play our sound effects. 
So let's, before we do that though, I got to turn this mesh renderer off for that barrier. We don't need that. Even though it was up above the screen, I just don't need to be displaying that. Um, so under our managers, let's right click, create empty, and we will say sound manager. I want to move the user input up to the top uh, because the game manager may check. I don't know if I, I will or not, but I want to make sure this is first in the execution order. Um, so for sound manager, we're going to go into our scripts under managers. Oops, did not mean to do that. Managers, right click, create C sharp script, sound manager. Wait for Unity to compile that. I'll select the sound manager here in the meantime. And I will drag the sound manager script onto there and double click to open it up. Zoom in, we don't need our transform, delete that. Uh, we want this to be a singleton mono behavior of type sound manager. There we go. And we're going to add a required component of type um, audio source. There we go. Now watch this. I'm going to go back out into the Unity editor and watch what happens here. As soon as it gets done recompiling. Look at that. It automatically added an audio source. Okay. Nice little trick. If you know something is going to need another type of component, like in this case, an audio source, just add it as a required component here. Then if you forget to add it in the editor, no problem. Unity will add it for you. Um, what we're going to do is add a public method here called play audio clip. It will take an audio clip parameter and an optional volume parameter, which is of type float, which will default to one. So if you don't specify it, it will play it at the maximum value. So this is from zero to one. And in start, well, actually in here, we're going to say audio source, play one shot, clip volume, but we don't have an audio source. Well, in our start method, we will say audio source equals get component. And we want to use the generic one, audio source. And put our cursor over here, alt enter, create field. Okay, so when we start, we will get the component, which we know we have because Unity will add it because of this required component. We will grab the component stored in this variable here. And then when we call play audio clip, we will call play one shot on that audio source, passing in whatever audio clip we received, playing it at whatever volume was specified. And if you don't specify the volume, it will play it at one. So let's go back into our player ship. And here where we say play torpedo sound, we will say uh, sound manager dot instance play audio clip torpedo sound. All right. And then up here, sound manager dot instance play audio clip fire sound. Jump back out into the Unity editor. And I notice that I have this here turned off. Um, so I think we should hear the sound if we're in the game view. Let's see what happens. Okay, of course I have an unlimited number of torpedoes, which I don't want, but we have sound effects. All right, let's give them something to shoot at. We're gonna create an enemy ship. So I'll right click. Create empty, call it enemy ship. And we're going to go into our art folder. Looking at this shooter sprite sheet, I'll double click to open it up in an image editor. And I think I want to use this guy down here. So he's down near the bottom. So I will expand this out, scroll down. And I think I want this guy right here. So I'm just going to grab him and drag him onto the enemy ship. Boom, there we go come up and select the parent. And we're gonna to wanna to make sure he's on the negative one on the Z axis. And let's add some components to him. We are going to add a box collider 2D and set it to is trigger. 
we're going to add a script to him. So let's go into our scripts folder, right click, create, C sharp script, enemy ship. Oh, and I want to put him on the enemies layer while Unity's thinking about that script. Enemy ship, enemies, yes, to children as well. All right, so grab that enemy ship script, drag it onto him, double click to open it up in the editor. All right, and let's go to work. There's gonna be a lot of stuff in this script. Uh, first thing is we want to implement the I hit barrier interface. And this ship is gonna have uh, some states. So I'm gonna create a new enumeration in here. I'm gonna put it down at the bottom of the file. It doesn't matter where it is, but I am gonna put it down here. I'm gonna say enum enemy state. And the states will be idle and attacking. All right, so we are actually going to have a variable here called enemy state, state. All right, let's add some serialized fields. We are going to have a vector two that we're gonna use for his spawn position. And it's gonna be from eight to I think I was playing around with it and I think something like 3.2 was working. We can check this by going back out into the Unity Editor and we're just gonna take him and select the Move tool, drag him up so he's on the top of the screen. But first I wanna turn on our reference image. So I, I basically want him to ride on the top of this beam. You see these little marks here on this screen capture? Those are enemy ships when they're real small. So they're gonna idle back and forth on top of that beam. And then when they switch to attack mode, they're gonna come straight down and shooting all the while. So let's come up here, select his move tool and just drag him up. Oops, I'm dragging the wrong thing. I wanna select the enemy ship. And I'm gonna set his scale down, something like that. Ooh, that's tiny. And I think I did end up moving his reference image. Yeah, so let's pick him again. Make a 0.25 and 3.2. There we go. That's a little high, I think. So let's just try three. I like that better. Yeah, so he's gonna go back and forth in idle state like this. And then as he comes down toward the player, I'm gonna grow him bigger and bigger and bigger. So we'll just leave that for now. And I'm gonna create a prefab from him. Go edit his script. So let's make this a three. All right, let's give him some floats. We're gonna give him a base move speed. And we're gonna default that to three. And we're going to give him an attack delay min, which I'm going to default to one, and attack delay max, which I will default to three. So that's gonna be the time between when he goes from idle to attacking. Let's create some more floats. Um, I want to have a max scale now I'll default that to 1.5. A fire delay min, which will be one. And a fire delay max, which I'm gonna to default to five. Okay, let's give him, what does it not like about this? It doesn't like the capital M. There we go. Okay, let's give him an audio clip for the fire sound. And we're going to give him a prefab for the projectile. And finally, we want to have a transform for the gun position, just like we did for the player ship. So let's go back out into Unity and assign some of these values. So these are all good defaults. We need to give them a fire sound. So I'm gonna right click and say properties, open up this little properties dialog. This way, uh, even when I select things in the inspector, 
this is not going to change. So I'm going to go into the sounds folder. You see how this changed, but this didn't. Let me shrink this down. I like that one. There is our fire sound. We don't have a projectile prefab yet, and we don't have a gun yet. So let's right click, create empty, call that gun, and double click that to open it up in the scene. And I'm going to zoom in here. Let's set them up. Let's see on this regular scale. Let's go ahead and scale them at one. Take that gun and move it down to about there. And then we are going to drag that into that gun transform position. Let's go ahead and create a prefab for the projectile. So I'll go into our prefabs folder. I'm going to close this for now. We're going to take the player projectile and we are going to control D to duplicate it. I'm going to rename it enemy projectile. We're going to put it on the enemy projectile layer and we're going to change its movement speed to be negative 10 so it will move down instead of up. Okay, I think that's all good. So I can go ahead and get out of that. Um, except we do want to change his sprite. So let's bring that back up again. So we go into our art folder, and expand this again, find one that we like. I like this one. And I think we're probably going to have to change our circle collider. Yeah, that's a little bit too big. And that looks better. Okay, go back to our enemy ship and drag that enemy projectile into the projectile prefab. Okay, let's go back to editing that script. We've got all of our initial things there. Let's add some more variables. So we've got this enemy state variable. I'm going to move this enum up. All right, so after enemy state, let's add a variable for the direction. And this is going to go from negative one to one or vice versa. So one will be right, negative one will be left. And we want to have a float for the attack time and the fire time. Okay, let's add a Boolean here for should attack. This is going to be should he switch from idle to attack. And the condition will be that time.time .time is greater than or equal to the attack time. And we'll have one for should reverse direction. And I'm going to break this one out into a longer property with a getter. Uh, there's going to be two main conditions here. If he's going right and he gets to the maximum distance to the right, we want to flip around to the left. If he's going left and he gets to the maximum distance to the left, we want to flip around to the right. So we're going to say if direction is greater than zero so he's going right and transform.position.x is greater than or equal to spawn position.x then return true otherwise return direction is less than zero and transform.position.x is less than or equal to spawn position.x but negative x Get rid of that extra space there. All right. Okay, so if we're going left and our position is less than or equal to as far as we can go to the left, then we want to reverse direction. Okay, let's add our move speed. This is going to be a calculated speed, so I'm going to make it an expression body method. We're going to take our base movement speed. And we're going to add to it 0 0.5 times spawn position dot y minus our transform position dot y. So the farther we move from our upmost spawn position, the faster we're going to go. Okay, and let's see, we also want to increase the scale of this guy. 
and make him get bigger as he approaches the player, as he gets closer to the bottom of the screen. And we're going to use math.min. So this is a nice little convenience function that's going to take two values and give you whichever one is the lowest. So we're going to do a calculation, 0.52f times our spawn position dot y minus our transform position dot y. And then the other value will be our max scale. So whatever is the lowest between those two values is what we're going to be. So we'll never get any bigger than max scale. And finally, let's have a should fire bool. And that's just going to be if time dot time is greater than fire time. All right. Let's get into some actual code here. Uh, let's add a start method. So in start, we want to subscribe to the game state changed event. And I will all enter create method. And we'll rename this game state. And we want to enter our idle state. So in our idle state, we want to set our state to be idle. We want to reset our position to be a new vector three. And we're gonna give it a random range for the X position and then the actual Y position that we specified in our spawn position. So let's see, random dot range, range. And it's confused about which one we want to use. So that's because it added this using system, which we don't want. So, hmm. Oh, that's why. Get rid of that. Sometimes rider shoots itself in the foot. Random dot range. So we want to go from spawn position, negative spawn position dot X to spawn position dot X. The second value will be spawn position dot Y. And then we always want to be negative one on the Z axis. Oh, I forgot the dot X. Okay. And let's set our scale to a new vector three. 0 0.25, 0 0.25, one F. And that needs to be an equal sign. And let's set our attack time. So we're gonna add another random range. Why does it do that? Random dot range. Attack delay min. Attack delay max. All right, that enters idle state. I want to after start have an update method. Actually, one thing I want to do is on destroy, I want to unsubscribe from this event. Let's see, on destroy. There. Should always unsubscribe to events that you subscribe to. And an on game state change, the only thing we want to check for is if the game state is equal to game over, then we just want to destroy our game object. Clean up any enemies that are flying around when the game ends. All right, so now we need an update method. And an update, this is where the actual logic for this guy is going to live. The first thing we want to do is say, are we playing? So game manager dot instance that is playing. If we're not playing, just return. Otherwise, let's do a switch on our state. And if it is idle, then we want to handle idle. And if it is attacking, we want to handle attacking. Okay, so handle idle. Let's do that one first. If we should attack, then we want to enter the attack state. 
and return. Otherwise, if we should reverse direction, then direction minus or times equals negative one. So we're just going to go from one to negative one or vice versa. And then lastly, in here, we want to move var position equals transform dot position. So I'm saving our position into a local variable. Then we're going to update the x axis by our direction times our move speed, that's our calculated move speed, times time dot delta time. And assign that back to our transforms position. Let's go ahead and enter attack state. So enter attack state. We want to set our state to be attacking. And then we want to check and see if we should set our fire time. So the way this works is the very first time you go into the attack state, I want to set a fire time to be some delay. Otherwise, I just want to keep whatever our fire time has been counting down since we last set it. So I'm going to say that if, and I'm going to use a little helper function here called mathf.approximately. So I'm basically saying if our fire time is approximately zero and that will handle any floating point imprecision, then I'm going to call set fire time. Okay, and set fire time is very simple. We're just going to say fire time equals time dot time plus a random range. I cannot type random, random range, fire delay min, fire delay max. All right, come back here. So we have set our fire time. That's all we need to do in here. We need to handle, okay, this is in the wrong function here. I thought something was wrong. So I put the code for handle idle and handle attack. So let's fix that and let's implement handle attacking. So in handle attacking, we're going to move down by adding vector three dot down times our move speed, our calculated move speed times time dot delta time. And then we're gonna increase our scale. First, we're gonna save it off. All right, save it off to a local scale variable. We are going to say that scale.x equals scale.y equals, equals our calculated scale. All right, and we're gonna assign that back to our transforms local scale and say, should we fire? And if we should fire, fire projectile. And I'm gonna select that, I'll enter, create method, fire projectile. So in fire projectile, we wanna reset our fire time. And we want to play our fire sound. And then we want to instantiate our projectile prefab at our gun's position using quaternion identity. All right, I think all that is left is when we hit the barrier, we want to enter our idle state and get rid of all these unused using directives. Okay, go back into the Unity Editor, let it recompile, I'll take a sip of water. Okay, so if all goes as planned, he will shrink to a quarter of a size, go back and forth for a couple seconds, and then come down whilst shooting at the player. Although, we need to add a barrier down here for him to hit to go back to idle state. So let's take our torpedo barrier here and control D to duplicate it, rename it, and call it bottom barrier since it's on the bottom. We're going to put this on the barrier layer and we're going to turn on his mesh renderer, double click him to see him in the scene view, 
drag that up there and we're just going to move them down a little bit below the bottom of the screen something like that should be good all right and let me look at this guy so he's got his box collider it's set to his trigger he's on the enemy's layer um, he's got his projectile prefab all that stuff looks good let's just uh, override his changes to save them all to the prefab and hit play and see what happens well that's odd and I also need to turn off that reference image but that was some odd behavior there So it's interesting because he shrunk and then got bigger again and then slowed down. So definitely something funky going on in that code. So that all looks good here. Let's go back and look at his script and see what I can see that might be wrong. Let's take a look at that move speed calculation, base move speed. I'm going to put this in parentheses. It probably doesn't matter, but Ryder's even telling me I don't need them. Ah, oh, aha. You all probably saw that when I did it and didn't say anything to me. Okay, let me go back into Unity and try that again. Okay, so that logic seems to be working. He's going back and forth. He's flying down. He's shooting. Um, we can probably fiddle with those values later if we want to play with them. But for now, I think that's good. I'm going to delete this enemy ship. Um, one thing we want to do is have an enemy ship spawner that will spawn waves of those things um, based on what level we're on. So let's create ourselves an enemy spawner. So under managers, I'm going to right click, create empty and call that enemy spawner. And we are going to create a script for that under managers here, right click, create C sharp script, enemy spawner. Wait for unity to recompile that and drag that script onto there there we go and then double click to open that up in the editor okay so we're going to add some serialized fields to this and to save myself some grief when i start using random later on i'm going to go ahead and create this random equals unity engine dot random so that writer doesn't get confused and try and suggest a different random uh, let's see, serialize field. We're going to add uh, an enemy ship for our prefab. We're going to want to have a boss prefab. So this is this guy is not just going to spawn the regular enemies. He's also going to spawn the boss that will go across the screen, kind of like the, the saucer and in space invaders. Let me fix that spelling. All right, uh, let's see. We want to have a maximum number of enemies and actually want that to be a base value. And we're going to increase that based on what sector we're in. So if you look at the uh, screen capture that I had put up initially, you'll see that on the scoreboard, it shows the sector. Uh, and think of sectors as levels. Um, so every level, we're going to increase the maximum number of enemies. So let's create a serialized field for that. That will be an integer and we'll say max active enemies base. And let's default that to eight. And we're gonna add two per sector. So on the first sector, there'll be 10 maximum enemies. On the next one, there'll be 12 and so forth. And then we want to have a delay min and max for how often it should spawn the next enemy. So we're gonna say add enemy delay 
min, and we'll default that to a second, and add enemy delay max, which I will default to three seconds. All right, so let's create a variable here for spawn time and a Boolean for whether or not we have spawned a boss. So the condition for spawning the boss, we're actually gonna have something on the game manager that tells how many enemies have to be destroyed before the boss will come out. And so every time you kill an enemy, we'll decrement that number. And so when that number is zero, we'll spawn a boss, but we only wanna spawn him once. So we're gonna have a Boolean to say whether or not we've spawned that. Uh, let's see, we wanna calculate our max enemies. And that's going to be an expression body method that uses that max active enemies base, but we're going to add to it our game managers sector times two. Now sector does not exist, so I'm going to alt enter and say create property sector. And we'll make this a private set and go back into our enemy spawner. So let's have a Boolean for whether or not we should spawn an enemy. Should spawn enemy, and this is gonna be a property with a getter. So first thing we wanna say is, are we playing? So as usual, if game manager dot instance is playing, so if not is playing, just return. And then we wanna see if our transform has a child count greater than or equal to the maximum number of enemies. So transform.child count, transform.child count greater than or equal to max enemies, just return. And we want to return false in these cases. Finally, the condition will be that time time is greater than or equal to spawn time. All right, so we're caching our transform in awake. In our start method, we want to subscribe to the game state changed event on our game manager. So I will all enter create method on game state changed, delete that exception and change this to game state. And we want to unsubscribe from that event in our on disable. So we'll change this plus to a minus to unsubscribe. Our update method, we will say if should spawn enemy, spawn enemy. And I always forget to hit escape so it doesn't auto complete. So I will ought, enter create method spawn enemy. So I'm going to move this down below there. And then on game state changed, I'm just going to say that if the game state is equal to playing, so we just switched to playing, then we want to start spawning. And start spawning is going to do a couple of things. We're going to have some events on our game manager for when an enemy is destroyed. Basically, we're gonna call it enemies updated. So whenever the number of enemies is updated, basically when one is destroyed, we wanna be notified. And then also if the sector is updated, we wanna to subscribe to that as well. So I'm going to say game manager dot instance dot enemies updated and we will say on enemies updated. Now this doesn't exist, so I'm going to hit F12 to go up here and I'm gonna create a new event, public event action int enemies updated. And we are going to initialize that to an empty delegate. And I wanna do the same thing for the sector sector update it and initialize that to an empty delegate go back into our game manager fix that spelling alt enter create that method and i'm going to move that down 
to the bottom. And we also want to subscribe to the game manager instance sector updated. Alt enter, create method, move that down to the bottom. Don't need these exceptions, don't need them. And we're going to call a method here called spawn initial enemies. So alt enter to create that method. And what we're going to do in here is we're going to do a for loop. And we want to go to four plus two times the game manager's instance sector times two. So basically we're going to go six on the first sector, eight on the next sector, 10 on the next sector. So every sector you'll start with more initial enemies. And we're just going to say spawn enemy. And then auto complete it to the wrong one. And that's all we need for spawn initial enemy. So in spawn enemy, and this doesn't really make sense for the spawn initial enemy, but it doesn't matter. We're going to set the spawn time. And then we are going to actually instantiate the enemy ship prefab and make it a child of our transform. That way our child count will correctly register the number of active enemies because they're children of our transform. And with the, for the spawn time, we're just going to say that spawn time equals time dot time plus, and we're going to use random range. And again, I have so much trouble typing this random range. We're going to use the add enemy delay min, add enemy delay max. And there we go. So what do we want to do in on sector updated, we want to reset our boss spawned to be false. So every time we start a new sector, we want to say we haven't spawned the boss on this sector yet. And then in on, and I put this in the wrong one, control X, I want that to be an on sector updated. And on enemies updated, I want to say if enemies, and we need to change this parameter to be enemies, and I probably should change this to sector, even though we're not even going to look at that one. So if enemies is less than one, then we want to spawn a boss. Alt enter, create method. And here we're going to say, if not boss spawned, actually we want to say, if we have spawned a boss, let's return. I like to do early exit short circuit evaluations instead of having a nested block in here. Uh, then we're going to set our boss spawn to be true and we're going to instantiate our boss prefab, which doesn't exist and make it a child of our transform. And I'm going to comment this out and I'm going to add a to do add boss. Okay. I think that's good. We'll just get rid of these unused directives. Go back into our Unity Editor. Now, these values look good. We have to give us an enemy ship prefab. So we'll come over to here and say enemy ship. And let's hit play and see if it doesn't start spawning enemy ships. It doesn't look like it spawned a whole bunch of initial ones, though. Because game state never changed. So that will start working when we create our menu system uh, where we have a start screen and then we start playing. Start spawning will get called and it will do this. So we, we actually need to do that. Um, probably as our next step. But before I actually do that, I want to go ahead and create our boss. And then we'll start working on the UI and get that piece working. So we can create an empty here. Actually, I'm going to duplicate our enemy ship. So Control D to duplicate. 
and I'm going to rename that boss. Oops, I thought I was on it. Rename boss. Okay, and open that up. We're going to change the sprite. Um, so actually, if we go to our art folder, we're going to use this one here. So I'm going to drag that right into there. I think that's a cool looking boss. And I'm wondering if I want to make him bigger. What would he look like if we drag him into the scene? No, that's good. Well, yeah, let's make him bigger. So he's a big old boss. And we're going to move him up to the top of the screen. Let me turn on our reference image and move him negative one. He should already be. Oh, I moved the sprite up there. Let me delete that. And I want to make sure I'm not saving this. Let's go to our prefab for the boss. Make this two by two. And he's already negative one on the Z. So that looks good. Let's go ahead and move him up. I don't think we do want him to be that big now that I think about it. Yeah, that'll be fine. So he will spawn off the screen. And then he's going to move over that way. And we need to add a boss barrier over here. So let's take this boss, put him on the boss layer. Apply that to our prefab. And I think he's probably not going to shoot. So we're going to get rid of this enemy ship component. We'll give him a different script. And let's create a boss barrier. So we'll take this bottom barrier and we will duplicate it and I'm going to rename it and call that boss barrier and we're going to rotate it uh, wrong axis well, on this axis there we go and it doesn't need to be nearly that big either so let's come over here and actually it just needs to be big enough for the boss to hit it put it over here and then we'll change that to boss barrier and this is going to call the hit barrier method so if we go back into the editor we need to on our boss add component hit uh, let's see actually I need to add a script to him so I probably should create a boss mover script I'll just call it boss so here under scripts, I will right click, create C sharp script, boss, wait for Unity to compile that, drag him on there, double click to open up in the editor, zoom in, add a serialized field for his move speed. We are going to sub, uh, implement the I hit barrier interface. And in here, when the boss is destroyed, we're going to go to the next sector. So we're going to say game manager dot instance next sector, which does not exist yet. So I will alt enter to create that. Delete that for now and add a to do and implement next sector. And after we do that, we're just going to destroy the game object for the boss. And in our update method, we're going to move the boss. It's going to be very simple. We'll say transform dot position plus equals vector three dot left times move speed times time dot delta time. Very simple script. Go back into Unity. And we should see the boss go across the screen. I'm going to turn off our reference image should see him go across the screen and then disappear. I'm going to turn off play maximize so we can watch it in the inspector and in the scene view. And he's gone. All right. So we have a boss. Uh, now we can go back to, I'm going to delete that. Well, let me update the overrides, make sure everything's applied there. Now I'll delete him from the scene. We will go into our enemy spawner and we will drag in the boss prefab. Oh, we haven't 
uncommon at that method yet. Go into here, add boss, boss prefab, go down to the bottom. All right, go back into the Unity editor, delete him from the scene again, select our enemy spawner, go to the prefabs folder, drag the boss into there. All right. So all that is in place so that when we have destroyed enough enemies, the boss will spawn, go across the screen. If the boss is destroyed or if he reaches the end and goes away, then we will advance to the next sector. Um, we need to have the ability to destroy a boss or an enemy for that matter. Um, but before we get to that, I want to take an initial stab at the UI. So for the UI, we've got this little group here. Let me go ahead and collapse some things here. So we have our canvas. On our UI itself, I want to put a script. So I'm going to go into scripts, shrink this down, right click, create folder, and call this UI. Double click in there. And I want to call this a new script in here. I want to call this scoreboard UI. Let Unity recompile that. And I'm going to drag that onto there. Now, we need to add some things under our canvas here. Um, I'm going to create an empty game object. And I'm going to call that scoreboard. I'm also going to create an empty game object here. And I'm going to call that start screen. And another one called game over screen. Or just game over. All right, so under our scoreboard, we want to create a text mesh pro. So under UI, text, text mesh pro. Uh, and we are going to call this score. And I am going to, in here, hit hold down alt and click this. And I'm also going to click this so that it will be sized if we scale the screen we want it to scale horizontally and i'm going to grab the move tool here double click to show that in the scene view and i'm going to move that up to the center of the screen and for our font we're going to pick our nice arcade font and i'm going to show our reference image again and for the color I'm going to go back to our score here. For the color, I'm going to use the eyedropper and select that color right there. And go ahead and close our reference image for now. And in the text here, I'm going to put six zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we're going to want to increase the font size for that. I'm thinking something like 120. Now you notice it wraps around. So what we're going to do is we're going to center this horizontally and I'm going to use this cap line for the vertical alignment. And then under wrapping, I'll set that to disabled and move it down just a tad. So there is our score. All right. And I'm going to duplicate this. So click on that and hit control D rename. So right click rename and going to call that sector. And in here, I will say sector 01. We're going to change the font size for the sector to be 100. And I'm going to drag him down below the score. I think that looks good. We're going to duplicate this, control D. And I'm going to call this enemies. And this is going to be the number of enemies that need to be destroyed before the boss will spawn. And I'm going to go up to our rect transform and hit, hold down alt and hit that guy right there. And using the move tool, I'm gonna to move this over and up. And I think I wanna set the font size. I'll leave it, I'll leave it at 100. Uh, but we're gonna show our reference image again. Go back to our enemies, use the eyedropper and try and click on this little green here. There we go. 
And we're going to just change this to 12. And I think I want to move that over some more. Well, they display it like right there. I'm kind of like right on where they displayed theirs. Looks like ours could be a lot bigger, doesn't it? Um, let me turn off that reference image and just see. I'm going to not follow theirs exactly. So I'm going to move. Oops. I'm going to move our enemies over some. I just like the way that looks better. Now we also want to display the number of torpedoes we have left and the number of player lives that we have left. So this is all on the UI layer, which is all good. Oh, let's change this to UI. Yes, okay. Uh, under scoreboard, I'm gonna right click and create empty. And I'm going to call this torpedoes. And coming up here, I'm gonna hold down Alt and hit that. And what we're gonna do in here is we're gonna add a horizontal layout group. And I wanna have something like 12 and a half units of spacing in between. We will child align middle left. We wanna control the child size we don't want to force them to expand. I was playing around with this and we'll play around with that too, but I'm going to give it some initial values. Now, we, if we drag in uh, a torpedo object, um, we should start to see them align themselves horizontally in that general area. So if we double click this, you'll see where it is in the UI screen. Uh, so we need to create some kind of object that will serve as a torpedo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click here and I'm going to go UI image. And then for the sprite, I want to use the image that we selected for our torpedo. So if I double click that, I think it'd be faster just to go to our sprite sheet. But here we go. This is what I want to use for our torpedo. And if I hit control D, you see, we got three of those guys right there. And I'm going to drag that down a little bit because I don't really like where that's positioned. Maybe move it over some. There. So I'll go ahead and take this and rename it to Torpedo. Actually, I'm going to rename it to Torpedo UI. I'm going to delete these guys. And I'm going to create a prefab from this. So I'm going to end the prefabs. I'll create a new folder here. Call that UI. And I'm going to drag that into there. And then I'm going to delete that. And I want to do something very similar, but for the player live. So I'm going to control D duplicate rename and call that player lives. And we're going to alt and anchor it down there. And this one, I'm going to set to 200 by 50. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to right click UI image. And then for our image, this time I'll just go to our arts folder, expand these guys. And we want to use our player ship. So I'm going to take this, drag that in there. And don't really like the way that looks. But let's first of all move him down and to the left. And for this, so all these things look good. I'm just not sure why he looks kind of stretched. See if we control D. Oh, okay, so that's kind of interesting. I think maybe I don't want to control his width. So let's come up here and turn off that and delete this and delete that. Okay, that looks a lot better. Okay, I was confused by why he looks stretched. I'm going to rename this and I'm going to call this player life UI. 
go into our prefabs folder UI and then drag that in there and then delete this. All right, so now it's time to edit the script that will display those UI elements. So we'll open that up in the editor and add our serialized fields. So let's see, we're gonna have so our TMP text fields. So it's gonna add the using statement using TM Pro. And we want one for score, one for sector, and one for enemies. We want to have a transform for our torpedoes. We'll call that torpedoes container. And we want to have a transform for player lives. And then we want to have our prefabs. So we will have a torpedo UI. We don't have a script for that. So we're just going to use game object. And we will say torpedo UI prefab and player life UI prefab. Let me fix the spelling. There we go. All right. We don't need our transform. So we can get rid of this awake. Uh, and start. We want to initialize a bunch of stuff. Um, so one thing, we're going to have to add a bunch of events to our game manager for when the score changes, torpedoes changes, player lives change. We already have enemies updated and sector updated. Uh, but we're going to want to subscribe to all these events and on start. So let's see, we us have game manager. So I want the UI to be event driven. So we're not constantly polling to see what the values are we should display. We're only going to update our UI when something changes. So that's why I'm adding these event subscriptions here. So score changed plus equals on score changed. And we want to do torpedoes update it on torpedoes update it. We want player lives changed on player lives changed and Enemies updated. Um, enemies updated. And sector updated. Okay, so let's go ahead and add these to the game manager. We will have public event action int score changed. Initialize that to an empty delegate public event action int torpedoes updated initialize that to an empty delegate public event action player lives changed initialize that to an empty delegate and I did something wrong here ah I'm an idiot int There we go. Typing faster than I can think. Go back into scoreboard UI and we need to create all these functions. So alt enter create method tab shift delete. Change this to sector. Alt enter create method tab shift delete. Change this to enemies. Alt enter create method shift delete change this to player lives Alt enter create method tab shift delete torpedoes Alt enter create method tab shift delete score double click to select it all oops all right there we go, score. Okay, so we want to unsubscribe and on disable. Actually, we can do that in destroy. On destroy. And I just need to change all of these plus signs to minus. 
so that we unsubscribe. All right, on score change. Actually, one thing I want to do is on enable, I want to call those guys when we first enable to make sure that we set the score correctly. So on enable, I will say on score changed game manager.instance.score. So we actually need to expose that. Uh, we want to do on player lives changed game manager.instance.player lives. Uh, let's see on torpedoes updated game manager.instance.torpedoes. And let's see on enemies update it game manager dot instance dot enemies. I'm going to call that enemies until boss. And finally on sector update it game manager dot instance dot sector. All right, so let's go ahead and create these. So alt enter, create property, make that a private set. Go back, uh, let's see, go back into here. Alt enter, create property, make that a private set. And alt enter, create property, private set. Okay, so that should handle our initial score. So now how do we wanna handle all of these different things. So when the score changes, we're gonna say score.text equals, so I'm doing what's called string interpolation. I put a dollar sign in front of the quotes, and then I can put a variable value in here. So I'll put score, which is being passed in, and then we're gonna format it and call it D6. So what that will do is it will display the score with leading zeros up to six digits. Um, if you ever get more than 999,999, um, I'm not sure. I guess it would display seven digits. Um, but this is going to make sure if you have six or fewer digits that it has leading zeros. Uh, for torpedoes, um, we're going to add a method here called update child UI elements. We're going to pass in the torpedoes container we're going to pass in the number of torpedoes and the torpedo ui prefab all right so i'm going to alt enter create method tab and shift delete i'm going to select this whole block of code Control alt shift and this might not work in visual studio but i'm just going to move this all the way down to the bottom of the file uh, we want to do the same thing for the player lives changed. Let me just copy this, paste this, and we're just going to change this to player lives container, player lives, oops, player lives, and then this will be the player life UI prefab. All righty. Uh, on enemies updated, we will say enemies.text equals, we're just going to say enemies.toString. We don't need to pad that with zeros or anything. And then for sector updated, we will say sector, oops, did I get it right? Yeah, sector.text um, equals string interpolation. Actually, we want to, and outside of the braces, we want to say sector. So we're going to display the string sector followed by sector and format that as a two digit integer with a leading zero if it's less than 10. All right, now we need to implement this update child UI elements. So we want to get the number of children currently in the container that was passed in. Let me rename this to container let me rename this to elements and let me rename this to prefab so it's generic okay so children 
will be container dot child count. And if we have more children than there are elements, we want to delete one until we have the right number. So we're going to say while children is greater than elements, then we will say child equals container dot get child and then we will decrement children and this needs to have a type so we'll just call it var so we're going to grab a child at whatever children was minus one so let's say there were three children and there's only two elements we're going to grab the element at position two so it's zero base so zero one two for three elements so we're going to decrement this first and then get the child at that position and then we'll come back and reevaluate this guy but after we grab the child, we want to set its parent to null. So he's no longer a child. And then we want to destroy it. We really want to destroy his game object. So that will delete children from our container until there are no, until we don't have more than the number of elements. And then if we don't have enough children, we'll say while children and then we'll increment after we do this evaluation. So I'll put the plus sign after the variable. So while our children is less than a number of elements, increment that, and then we are going to instantiate a prefab and make it a child of our container. So we'll install, instantiate either a torpedo UI or a player life UI, and then make it a child of that container. That should update our display accordingly. Go back out into the Unity Editor. And we need to populate all these things. So we'll drag our score into here, our sector into here, our enemies into here, torpedoes container into here, player lives container into here. Go look at our prefabs, UI, player life prefab, torpedo UI prefab. All right, so that is all there. Now, we don't have any torpedoes or player lives, so we won't see anything for those, but it should say, it should look exactly the same like this. Um, this will probably be zero. Yep. So that is at least rendering correctly. Uh, now we need to implement some stuff to have a start screen. Um, and we want to also set those sector and player lives and torpedoes values correctly. Starting with our start screen, we'll expand the UI, uh, collapse the scoreboard. Under start screen here, I'm going to right click and I'm going to go down to UI and create a panel. Now this is funky. This should fill the whole area. So there's something wrong with my canvas. Uh, now, I thought I had changed this already, but we want to change this to scale with screen size and we want to give it a reference resolution of 1920 by 1080. That will make sure if we pick different game resolutions, our UI will scale accordingly. So this panel, if I go up to here and I hit Alt and click this, actually, let me just destroy it to start with and create a new one. UI panel. Hmm. I think this guy also needs to fill. There we go. All right. Okay, so this guy is now filling the entire screen. And we want to change this background color here. Um, I don't really like the way that looks. And I want to rename it too. So let me call this start screen. Just start screen would be fine. Um, we are going to bring that down to something like that. Maybe increase the opacity a little bit. Yeah, I kind of like the way that it, so you can still sort of see what's underneath it, but it does indicate that this is a whole different screen. Uh, what I want to do now is add some text for start game. Uh, I want to give a title of the game and then press fire to play. So we'll right click on this and go to UI Text Mesh Pro, and we're going to say beam rider we're going to pick our arcade font and for the color i want to do some sort of a bluish color something like that 
And for the font size, I think I'm going to go with uh, 128. We will center horizontally, use cap line for the vertical alignment, turn off that, and maybe just move that up a little bit, kind of like that. Then I will duplicate, let me change the name of that. I like to title things, so I'm going to call that title. I'll just call it Beam Rider. Select that, Control D to duplicate, right click, rename, press fire to play. Down here we'll change this text to press fire to play. And I want to change the font size something like that drag that down there that looks good now let's go up to here and on this parent element we want to create a script for it so under UI right click create C sharp script call this start screen UI and select this parent node here that is the parent of the panel and drag that script onto there and double click to open that up in the editor. Don't need our transform or that awake method. We will add one serialized field, which is gonna be our start screen panel because we wanna be able to turn it on and off. Now, when this thing enables, we want to subscribe to our user inputs on fire pressed event. Let's see, we're going to call that start game. I'll enter create method. All right. Uh, the other thing we want to do is we want to enable that panel. Now, when we start the game, we want to unsubscribe. Let me just copy and paste this. We want to unsubscribe from this event. We want to disable that panel and we want to tell the game manager to start the game so that's going to be a new function all enter create method start game now before we go and implement all the stuff in start game i want to go out into the unity editor and assign that panel here in the inspector All right, so now if we go back into Rider, we can start implementing this. So one thing we want to do is reset the score if it's a new game. Uh, we want to update our torpedoes to three because you start with three torpedoes. I want to update player lives to three because you're going to start with three. I want to update our enemies to be 12 in a new game you're always going to have to kill 12 before we get to a boss i don't know if that's the way it is in the real game but that's the way i'm doing it we want to set the sector to be one and we want to spawn a player ship and we want to set the game state to be playing so we got a lot of functions we need to implement here let's start with setting the game state So in here, we're going to say game, game state equals playing, or equals game state, excuse me. And then we want to fire the event, game state changed, and pass in our new game state. All right. Next, let's spawn player ship. In here, we want to instantiate Stanchi eight the player ship prefab. So that's something we need to add. So up here we don't have any serialized field yet. So after all of our public things here, let's add a serialized field player ship player ship prefab. All right. So that will do that. Say update sector. We will say that sector equals sector and then sector, oops, sector update it. 
sector. All right, update enemies. Enemies until boss equals enemies. I always, I need to hit tab at the end of those lines so that it doesn't go back to the beginning of the line. Um, Ryder's just trying to be too smart. So enemies update it, enemies until boss. All right, update player lives. You should be sensing a pattern here. Uh, player lives, player lives equals player lives, tab, enter, okay. Um, player lives changed, player lives. Update torpedoes, torpedoes equals torpedoes and torpedoes updated torpedoes and then reset score we will say score equals zero score changed score and I want to add a public function to add points we're going to want to implement all this stuff too at some point I want to move these public functions up above the unity functions. All right. So let's see. I want to have public void add points int points. And here I will say score plus equals points, score changed points or score. All right, for next sector, we will increment our sector. We will set enemies until boss <clears throat> to be eight plus two times sector. Actually, I think I want that to be 10 plus two times sector. Uh, torpedoes, we'll set to three. So I'm not sure if in the original game, if you get all your torpedoes back when you start a new sector, I'm just going to give them all back. Uh, we're going to update enemies with enemies until boss. We're going to update sector with sector. We're going to update torpedoes with torpedoes. All right. And what do we want to do when we fire a torpedo? We want to say update torpedoes, torpedoes minus one. Okay. So let's see if any of this works. Go back into our Unity editor. I'm going to save my project just in case it crashes. Grab my gamepad. I should come up to the start screen. Oh, but it started playing already. Um, that's interesting that those enemies were moving and stuff, even though I had not started playing. I think we need to initialize our game state uh, somehow so that we don't think we're already playing. So let's go back into our game manager. I just noticed we had not assigned our playership prefab. So let's see, go up here to prefabs and drag in the playership. We're gonna need that. And I'm gonna go ahead and make sure this guy is updated and then I'm just gonna delete him. So we don't, oops, so we don't start with a playership until the game manager spawns one. Go back into the game manager. And I think we want to have an on enable method so right here on enable. So when this guy is enabled, I want to make sure that the start screen is active. So I'm gonna to wanna to add a serialized field for that. Set active true. And I'm going to wanna to say set game state, game state waiting to start. So it doesn't think we're already playing. 
Let's go look at our serialized fields. We'll just add a game object for the start screen. And while I'm in here, I'll add one for the game over screen. Okay. Go back out into the Unity Editor. We should see them appear here, unless there were some compilation errors. Ah, oh. what did we call that? I capitalized it. Okay, going back out into the Unity Editor again. We should see them appear here. There we go. So I will put this for start screen and I'll go ahead and create a game over panel. Call that game over. Go back to the game manager and drag that right there. Okay, now hit play. Should come up to the start screen. Nothing should be happening. Ah, still they are moving. Okay, so why does it think we're already playing? Let me go look at that enemy spawner. Aha, this is the culprit right here. In our start method, we are setting game state to playing. Um, when really all we want to do in here is I want to say spawn player delay equals new wait for seconds three. And I'm going to create that field up here. Um, we're going to use that to determine when we should spawn a player. And where we're going to end up using this is we're going to have a method called handle player death. So when the player dies, we're going to call that. And it's going to delay for a few seconds before it spawns a new player ship. Um, but we're going to wait and implement that later. Um, I will add a to do here. Implement handle player death. But I think now that we've removed that setting game state to playing in our start method, this should now work correctly. I'm going to put this back to play maximized. Hit play. Should come up to the start screen and nothing should be happening. I got to get rid of that game over panel that's just sitting there. Uh, but if I hit play, it spawns the initial enemies and I can shoot. And of course, I'm not hurting them at all. They are shooting back. That's pretty cool. And their shots don't hurt me. They don't hurt me. Um, but we've got the basic game start screen working. So let's go ahead and take care of the game over screen. Um, we will make sure that this fills the entire panel. We're going to come in here and change this background color to be a darker color like that. It looks good. Uh, we're going to add some text mesh pro. So UI text, text mesh pro, game over. Um, one thing I want to do, I'm going to go into our scoreboard and let's look at our score. I'm going to copy this color, come back over here, paste. There we go. Let me go ahead and turn off this for now. Let's change this font to be our arcade font. And let's go ahead and set this to 128. And set it to center horizontally, cap line for vertical, disable wrapping. Select him with the move tool. Drag that up a little bit. And I want to rename this to be game over. Select that, Control-D to duplicate, rename, press fire to play again. Say press fire to play again. 
set that to 72. Use the move tool to drag it down. And there we go. We want to create a script for him. So we got the script for start screen. Let's do this under scripts UI, right click, create C sharp script, game over UI. Select that, wait for Unity to recompile. Drag that on there. Double click to open up in the editor. We'll zoom in. We don't need this transform. Go ahead and delete all that. Oh, I guess we do need Unity Engine for mono behavior. All right, so for serialized field, we will add a game object for our game over panel. And in our start method, we are going to subscribe to the game manager's game state changed event. Alt enter create function. We'll change this to game state. Uh, we want to make sure that this panel is not active by default. So we don't want to see it. Now in on game state changed, we are say if game state is not equal to game state dot game over, then just return. Otherwise, we want to subscribe to the user input on fire pressed event. And if it's pressed, we want to call a new function called start game. Okay, and we also want to enable the game over panel. So if the state changes to game over, we want to display this panel. We want to subscribe to the start game of, I mean, to the fire pressed event. So if that happens, we want to then, when fire is pressed, we want to unsubscribe from that event. We want to hide the game over panel and we want to tell the game manager to start the game. So that's it for our game over screen. Pretty simple stuff. Go back into the Unity editor. And when this recompiles, we'll drag in our game over panel. Uh, one other thing I want to do, let's go ahead and disable this panel and enable that panel. One thing I want to do, oops, I want to handle when they quit. I added if you remember in our user input, we have an on quit event, but we're not currently doing anything with that. Um, so I think what I want to do is I want to add a script. I'm going to call it um, exit on quit. I think sounds good. So up here in the root of our scripts folder, I will right click create C sharp script. I will call that exit on quit. And then I will double click to open that up in the editor. Zoom in, we don't need this transform. In our start method, we are going to subscribe to our user inputs on quit pressed event. And we'll call a method called quit application. I will alt enter to create that function. Now we're gonna do something in here. Quitting an application is different if you are in the editor or if you're running in a standalone build. So uh, the first thing I want to do is unsubscribe from this event. So no matter where we're running, if we're in the editor or if this is a standalone build, we're going to unsubscribe from that. Uh, the other thing I want to do is put a preprocessor directive. So I'm going to say pound if unity underscore editor and then close that. So if I'm in the editor, then I want to call unity editor dot editor application and set is playing to false. That'll stop playing if we're in the editor. Else, I want to say application dot quit. And I should point out this will not work on a WebGL app and on an iOS app or Android app, it will actually close the application, but it will still be running in the background. So you can't like force quit an iOS or Android app 
you can kind of give the illusion that you are, but you're not really. All right, so we'll unsubscribe from the event and we'll quit. Let's go ahead and give this a quick test. We need to put this on an object though, or it's not gonna run. So we're gonna wanna go back into the Unity Editor and I think we'll put this on the Game Manager. So I'm gonna say Add Component, Exit on Quit. So now if we hit Play, and we come up to our Start screen, if I hit the X button, it should quit. And it did not. And if I hit Escape, it did not. Okay, so why would that be? Let's go look at our user input. There is On Quit. Ah, spelling error. And it doesn't, you know, Ryder would not catch this because it doesn't know anything about where this is coming from. Um, that's one of the disadvantages of the way the new in Unity input system works. So let's go back in here and try this again. Hit X. Still didn't work. Let me see what these errors are in my console. That could be related. No reference exception. Oh, did I forget to assign some things in my inspector? Let me get rid of that comment. Right, let's go back into the Unity Editor and look at our inspector. Pick the game manager. Well, there is that. Let me just get rid of this line. Clear, hit play. Still can't quit, I can start. And this I think is happening because I'm closing the game in here and not cleaning things up. Let me, uh, Go into our user input. Quit. I'm going to make this a function and I'm going to say debug.log quit pressed. Then I'm going to call on quit pressed. And then in our exit on quit, I'm going to debug log quit application go back out into the unity editor you know some youtubers might edit out the struggles uh, i want you to see how the sausage is made sometimes you know you overlook something simple i'm sure this is a silly mistake i'm making um, but i want you to see how you go about debugging things like this so i'm going to change this to play focus instead of play maximize i want to be able to see what's in my console i want to be able to see what's in the inspector Let's go ahead and hit play. So no errors in the console. Um, I will hit X. So it is calling quit application. It's just not working. Um, so we are handling the input correctly. It just is not exiting. So let's go look at our exit on quit and see what might be wrong in there. So Game Manager, exit on quit. <laughs> you probably saw that and were yelling at me. Autocomplete bit me. Well, hey, we did find um, another issue, but let's just go ahead and give this a test. It should work now. I'll hit play and then I'll hit the X button on my gamepad. And it quit. All right, let's try it again and hit escape. So if it works with the keyboard, and it did. Now we'll do it again. I'm going to hit start because I want to show you on the UI that we are showing our torpedoes and player lives. I didn't point that out before. So there are our player lives, and there are our torpedoes. I'm going to fire a torpedo, and you can see they go down. And now I should not be able to fire any more torpedoes, and I can't. All right, and I am getting some errors here that I'm probably going to want to look into. So essentially, 
I, I only want to call this if elements is greater than or equal to zero. So I will say if torpedoes is greater than or equal to zero, and here I want to do the same thing and say if player lives is greater than or equal to zero. And the other thing is I probably in the game manager when I fire torpedoes, let's see, fire torpedo, I want to say math, math dot max torpedoes minus one, zero. So we'll never go below zero. Just give that another quick test and we shouldn't see any more errors. Oh, but it's letting me fire when I shouldn't. So let's go back into the player ship. Keep uncovering all these little bugs. Uh, go into our prefabs, player ship, open up this script here, and should fire, is there a should fire torpedoes? I'm looking at enemy ship. I want to look at player ship. So I will control comma, player ship, and let's see, on torpedo pressed, I'm not even checking. I want to move this code out into a fire torpedo method. I want to say if can fire torpedo, and then I'm going to take this, highlight all of it. I'm going to right click, refactor, extract method, and I'm going to call that fire torpedo. So it's always good to test along the way to make sure that you're writing what you think you're writing. Let's go ahead back into Unity Editor, hit play, and I should not be able to fire more than three torpedoes. All right, fix that bug. I think the next thing we want to do is get it to where we can actually blow up the enemy ships um, so we're going to add an explosion animation, we're going to add the explosion sound effect, and we're going to add a script so that items that can be destroyed are actually destroyed when they should be destroyed. So let's create our explosion animation. I'm going to collapse our UI here, and I am going to go into our art folder, and I'm going to select all of these explosion guys, and I'm going to drag them right into here. And it wants to create an animation. So under Assets, Animations, oh, we already did that, didn't we? Okay, let's go look at those. So we have an explosion animation. We want to turn off loop time because we do not want this to loop. Let's go ahead and save that. This is the explosion animator. Uh, I'm going to rename that to just be explosion instead of explosion one. And if I double click that, we see this right here. I'm going to create a new empty game object here. I'm going to call this explosion. And I'm going to add to it a sprite renderer. And we're going to go into our art folder and take this first explosion guy and drag him onto there. All right, I'm going to turn off our start screen for now. Just so I can see that better. Uh, I'm going to take this guy, I'm going to add an animator component. And then for our animator controller, we're going to pick that explosion. And we don't need an avatar. All right. And I think I want to add a script to this guy to handle how this explosion works. We want to basically um, delete this thing after the animation is finished playing. We also want to play an animation, uh, an explosion sound effect. So I'm going to go under our scripts folder here and I'm debating on whether or not I should create a subfolder for this. Um, I think I'm not. 
I'm just going to put it in here. So I'm going to right click, create C sharp script and call this explosion. If I was going to have more effects, I would probably create an effects subfolder. So let Unity recompile that. I'm going to select this guy and drag that script onto there. And then I'm going to double click to open that up in the editor and zoom in so you can see what I'm doing. Um, we're not going to need our transform, so I'll get rid of all this. Let's add a serialized field for our sound clip or audio clip. This will be explosion sound. And we want to add a variable to save our animator in. And I want to add a Boolean to say whether or not the animation is finished. And this would be a property with a getter. And if we don't have an animator, then I just want to return true. Yes, the animation is finished. Um, otherwise, I want to grab the state info off of the animator. Get current animator state info. And I want to return state info dot normalize time is greater than or equal to one dot F. One F. So basically, if it's finished playing the entire animation time, it's done. All right, so in our awake method, I want to grab that animator off of the object that we're attached to. We're using git component. Okay. And then in start, we're going to actually make our start method a coroutine. So we're going to do that by saying add um, I enumerator. And we want to use the one in system collections. So that added the system collections up to the top. So I enumerator start. And we want to say if we have an audio clip or sound, explosion sound. If we have an explosion sound, then we want to say sound manager dot instance dot play audio clip explosion sound. And then we want to say while not animation finished, yield return null. And so we're going to loop in this function until, move that outside of that if statement, until the animation is finished. And then we're going to destroy the game object. And that should be all we need to do for this guy. What is it complaining about? I got to give it an index. Okay. Because we only have one layer in our animation. And this guy is looking for a layer index. Okay. Let's go back into the Unity Editor. And I think if we were to just hit play, you would see an explosion animate right here. Well, you saw it. It was behind the scenes. Uh, but it did not play an audio clip because we did not give it one. Um, so if we go into our sounds, let me right click on this and say in properties so that this doesn't go away. Let's go to our sounds. And I'm trying to think, is that the sound I want to use? So we're going to drag that sound onto this guy here. All right, and I'm going to go into our prefabs and I'm going to drag this explosion down into there and then I'm going to delete that from the scene. So now all we have to do is instantiate that wherever we want to show an explosion. It will play the sound effect and do the animation. And I will delete this inspector window, take a drink, and let's go back to our enemy ship. I believe we want to add some stuff to it so that we can kill it. I think we want to add a script to it and call it killable. So enemy ship, double click that, collapse that, go into our scripts folder, right click, create C sharp script, killable. And when that recompiles, we'll drag that up onto our enemy ship. And double click to open that up. We'll zoom in. 
we don't need our transform, but we will want some serialized fields. We're going to want, we're going to create a new object called a screen flash. Um, there's a really cool effect in the game. Whenever you hit an enemy ship, the whole screen kind of flashes. So we're going to implement that, but that's going to be a to-do item. Okay, we're also going to want our explosion prefab. And we want to have the number of points that we should score when this item is killed. And I'm just going to give this a default value of 100. We're going to add a public function called kill me. And in here, we're going to call flash screen. We are going to show explosion. We're going to score points. We are going to tell the game manager that something died and tell them who died by passing in ourselves. Let's go ahead and alt enter to create that. And this is going to be used. Um, basically what we're going to use that for is so we can keep track of how many um, enemies are left before we spawn the boss. So I'm just going to rename this to entity and I'm going to stub out some functions in here and put to do statements in there. I'm going to say handle enemy death entity handle boss death entity and handle player death. Entity. And I will say alt enter create method player. Actually, I'm going to leave that called entity. And I'm going to just add a to do handle player death. Handle boss death. Handle enemy death. Okay, going back into our killable script. We are going to destroy the game object. So if this is something that can be destroyed. When you call kill me, we'll flash the screen, show an explosion, add points, let the game manager know I died, and then destroy ourselves. For show explosion, we're going to say if we have an explosion prefab, then we want to instantiate the explosion prefab at our position using quaternion identity for the rotation. Easy peasy Japanesey. For a flash screen, We'll do that. Okay, so now, how do we handle kill me? When are we going to call kill me? So I think we need to add another script for this. I'm just going to, at the bottom of this file, say public class kill on touch mono behavior. And I am going to alt enter move to kill on touch.cs we will zoom in and i'm just going to add an on trigger enter 2d i'm going to rename this parameter to other and i'm going to say if not other dot game object dot try get component i want the generic version killable out var target so if we don't find, get rid of these. If we don't find a killable component on whatever it is we collide it with, we're just going to return. Otherwise, we're going to call the kill me method on that target, and then we're going to destroy the game object. Because anything that can kill something by touch will also die when it touches it. So I'm thinking specifically here of projectiles. But also, if the player ship collides with an enemy ship, they'll mutually kill each other. So let's go into our prefabs, and we're going to want to look at our projectile prefab. So prefabs, player projectile, let me minimize this. We're going to add kill on touch. All right, that should be that simple. Oh, we need to go to our enemy ship. Do we already have the kill? We do. So that's already there. All right, let's go back 
hit play and see if I can't shoot and kill some enemies. I think I must not be assigning some prefabs in our inspector, but it did kill him. Um, so let's see, let's go to the player projectile. Okay, let's go to the enemy ship. Ah, we need to add his explosion prefab. So let's just drag that right there. Hit play. Of course, they're not killing me. And we're not killing them to collide with them, but our projectiles are killing them. And we are scoring points. I've got 600 points, 700. Okay, so we are able to kill the enemy ships. Let's add the screen splash effect. So first I wanna create a material for this. So come into our materials, right click, create, and material. I want to under universal pipeline, pick unlit, and then surface type will be transparent. Um, that should be good, good, good. I want to make this sort of an orange, maybe a little bit deeper reddish orange. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. I'm gonna rename this screen flash material. So for the screen flash, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna create a 2D object sprite square. And then for the material, we'll drag in that material there and we're going to resize this guy just to be big enough to cover the whole screen that's probably a lot bigger than we need um, but that should definitely cover the whole screen and we're going to add a script to this guy let's rename this um, let's see rename screen flash we're going to add a script to him to actually flash the screen so i'm going to right click create c sharp script screen flash whenever unity recompiles we'll drag that script onto our screen flash component and minimize that minimize that double click to open this up in the editor and zoom in and we do not need our transform but we do want some serialized fields we want our sprite renderer i could grab this off the component but if i can assign it in the inspector why the heck not there we go. Um, serialize field. We want the color. Actually, we want two colors. We want a start color and an end color. So the flash is going to initially pop off with the start color, and then it's going to fade to the end color. And we want to float for how long that whole process should take. So I'm going to call that fade time, and I'm going to default it to half a second. And we have a variable here called current time. So in an on enable, we are going to set the renderer's materials color to be our start color. And we're gonna set our current time to be zero. And then all the work is gonna be done in update. So we will say update. Our current time, we're gonna calculate using mathf.min. So whatever's less, we want the current time plus time dot delta time and our fade time all right and then we want to calculate a lerp amount so we're going to do this fade we're going to lerp do a linear interpolation so that we do this fade kind of smoothly so we're going to say the current time divided by fade time and now we're going to take our renderer's materials color and we're going to set it to color.lerp. We're going to use the start color as our initial color, our end color as our final color, and then lerp it using the lerp amount. And now we want to say if our current time is greater than or equal to our fade time, we want to just destroy this object. So when we spawn a screen flash, it's going to lerp from the start color to the end color over the fade out time, which in this case is half a second, and then destroy itself. So let's go back out into the Unity Editor. 
we need to assign these colors and we're going to want to assign our renderer. So the renderer we just drag from here. Uh, our start color, we can set to that. But what do we want to use for our fade out color, our end color? I'm thinking sort of a yellowish color, but with no opacity. So something like that, maybe a little bit yellower, but then with the alpha all the way at zero. So this alpha needs to be all the way up and this one needs to be all the way at zero. Okay. So let's create a prefab for that. And then destroy this and go into our killable script. And we can uncomment this. And then for this, uh, I think this should be pretty simple. All we're gonna wanna do is say, if we have a screen flash prefab, then instantiate our screen flash prefab. All right, let's jump back out into the Unity Editor, hit play and see if we can't shoot some enemies and see the screen flash when they die. Oh, did I sign that prefab? We'll find out. So it is not flashing. Let's go up to our enemy ship. We didn't assign it, okay. So let's take our screen flash prefab Sign that there, hit play. Oh, that's pretty. I don't know about you, but I think that looks pretty cool. Uh, next, we'll get the player ship dying. So we want the player ship to be able to die. We need to add that kill on touch. Well. If we want him to kill the other ship when he hits him, we add kill on touch. But we also need to add killable so that now he can be killed. We don't want to score any points, but we do want the explosion prefab and we want the screen flash prefab. I guess we can flash the screen when the player ship dies too. Um, that should handle the player dying. Um, the other thing we want to do is probably do the same thing for the boss. Um, we want to add the killable script to the boss. I'm gonna make him worth a thousand points. I have no idea what you're supposed to get when you kill him. And again, we'll add the explosion prefab and the screen flash prefab. So now we should be able to kill the boss and the player ship. But for all that stuff to really make sense, we need to implement those methods in the game manager that we added those to-dos for. So we wanna implement the player death, boss death, and player death. So it looks like I can go ahead and get rid of this to do here. And that's not ours. <laughs> so these are the only three that we've got left in our game to implement. So we want to implement player death. So how are we going to handle player death? So let's go find those functions. And here we go. So we'll do player death first. Um, first of all, we want to say if we don't have a player, so we'll look at the game object for the entity that was passed in and we'll try and get the player ship component off of it. If we don't have a player, just return. All right, otherwise we want to decrement the number of player lives. We want to call the update player lives. Actually, I guess what we could do is we could just say player lives minus one, because I do believe that this will assign it. It does. Okay. So we'll do that. Uh, then we want to say if the player lives is less than one, then we want to call game over. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. So that does not exist yet. And I also want to start a coroutine. So if the game isn't over, I want to start a coroutine to spawn player ship after delay. 
And so I will put I enumerator, the one from system collections. Let me copy and paste. And so in here, we're going to do a yield return spawn player delay. So this will wait until we have elapsed that amount of time, but we'll keep returning every frame so we're not blocking the application. And then we will spawn the player ship. All right. What about game over? What do we want to do in game over? Well, we want to set our game state to be game over. And we want to show the game over screen. All right. So I think that's all we need for handling player death. Let me rename this. Okay. How about boss death? So boss death is how we're going to know to go to the next sector. So we're going to do the same thing that we did here, except instead of looking for the player, we're going to look for the boss. Okay. And then otherwise we're going to say next sector. Okay. And then for the enemy death, we want to do the same thing. Look for an enemy, specifically an enemy ship. And then otherwise we want to say update enemies. Um, we're going to use math.max and it will be enemies until boss minus one or zero. And I think that's it. Let's jump out into the Unity Editor and give this a test. And what I expect to see is I expect to see our enemy count decrement up in the upper left corner, that green 12. Um, and if it gets to zero, we should see the boss come out. And then when the boss is either destroyed, actually, I don't know if we're handling if we kill the boss, but if the boss goes all the way to the end of the screen, it should go to the next level. So let me look at the uh, boss again. I just want to make sure that both conditions are handled. Yeah, he'll automatically call next sector if he does a hit barrier. And then the killable, which of course caused the game manager's entity died. The entity died method will handle boss death and go to next sector. So I think we're all good there. Let's go ahead and give that a test. Eight enemies till boss. Four. But we're not dying. So there's the boss. And we're now in sector two. Okay, so let me uh, figure out why the player ship is not dying. We'll go look at our prefab for our player ship. We have the killable. Let's look at our box collider. It's set to trigger. We have a rigid body that's kinematic. The player ship is on the player layer. Let's look at the enemy projectiles. They're on the enemy projectile layer. They don't have the kill on touch script. Okay, let's do that. The other thing we want to do is go to the enemy ship and add kill on touch. So they will kill the player if they collide with the player. Let's give that a shot. All right, and we're down to two lives. Something is up with our prefab. Our, for some reason, I'm not able to shoot a projectile. There's some bugs going on here because we have some errors here in the console. So this is our player ship. Our prefab should have a projectile prefab and a torpedo prefab. But for whatever reason, we're getting an all reference exception when we try and spawn our projectile after the player was killed once. Let's go up here to the game manager. We've got our player ship prefab here. 
the transform. Okay, let's go look at this again. Gun position. It's like it doesn't like the gun position on this. This should be on destroy. I think that's going to be our problem. So I think we weren't ever unsubscribing from this. And so our fire press event was getting called on the one that was destroyed. Letting you see how the sausage is made. Go ahead and let him kill me. Okay. Ah, it's harder than I thought it would be. Now, I should have gone to game over, so... We have some more errors in here. So we don't want to try and destroy it if we're already destroyed. I think that was like a race condition where he was hit and then the game ended. Um, I wonder if that was preventing our game over screen from showing up. Same thing there, it looks like. Um, let's see what happens. Was that, that was being called from game manager? Set game state. That was probably being called from game over. Yep. Let's give that another test. Let them kill me. So it's not quite working. See, same thing. And let me see if we're not successfully unsubscribing from those events. We should have, oh, look at that. There's the root of our problem right there. We didn't unsubscribe from that event. Copy and paste error. Game over, press fire to play again. Oh, we didn't hide that screen. I think, <laughs> I think I know what's wrong here. Uh, let's go to our game over screen. In this, I think I was showing this instead of, let's rename this so I can see for sure. Rename game over panel. Let's look. Yep, I was showing this field instead of the panel. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing here just to avoid confusion. Hit play. Can I clear the sector? No! It's harder than it looks. They're close. There goes the boss. Sector two. Game over play. Okay, so it works. Um, the game is working after a fashion. I'm not sure why we get this error. Um, if I look at this, it says that the user input was not cleaned up. So the user input is a singleton, just like all the other singletons, as part of this manager's object. For some reason, we're hanging on to that when the game is ending. It's not really a problem. It's not going to cause any issues. 
but it is going to display this error on your console every time. So I think we have implemented all the facets of the game that I wanted to implement. You could obviously add more enemies, um, but I will leave that to your imagination. Well, I hope you enjoyed watching that as much as I enjoyed making it. That was a fun project. And if you did like it and if you found it useful, do me a favor and click that like and subscribe button. It really does help to support my channel. And as I mentioned earlier, I put a lot of time and effort into making these videos and it helps motivate me to keep going when I see that people really appreciate my work. If you have any questions about anything I did or any suggestions about things you'd like to see, drop a comment down below or better yet, hop over to my Discord channel. I'll put a link down there in the description. So thanks so much for watching and good luck on your game development journey.